Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and go live. Ten minutes late. <laughs> All right. Oh, well, we can apologize. All right. There we go. And uh that's weird it's showing the live hey everybody uh i'm not sure what all it's just showing there we go okay uh hi everyone sorry we started a little bit late here um i was having some audio i wasn't able to hear my audio i have a very complicated setup here and sometimes it doesn't behave <laughs> <laughs> um anyhow uh yeah so it, it's been a while allison uh i'm here with allison mcdowell i think everyone already i don't think we need introductions at this point we're a um, team we're a team. Amazing. Yeah. And it's been a while since uh, we've done anything together. Uh, I know we've both been busy. looks like we've got some people already waiting and watching. So awesome. Thank you guys for joining us. Um, so those of you who know, like we did a show, I don't know, what was that, like a month and a half ago? How long ago was we did the Mark Andreessen show where we, we, we dissected an interview he did with Joe Rogan. Allison? Yeah. And, and Lynn. Yeah. I don't. Can you hear me? Yes. Did we lose each other again? No, I hear you. I hear you. Which, okay. <laughs> yes, to which part. Um, yeah, I can't remember exactly how long it is. But yeah, so there was a show that someone had alerted us to with um, uh, Joe Rogan was interviewing Mark Andreessen. And we kind of took it apart a bit uh, in terms of largely in terms of things that were left out and then some of the way the narratives were being structured in that interview, which was long. I mean, it's like an almost a three hour long interview on their end. And um, it actually, I, I think it, it got a lot of interest. I think we're some of the only people who are sort of deconstructing the interviews that way. Um, so yeah, so we did that. Yeah, exactly. So uh, there's, there's, a, there's another figure here that, that, maybe is, is just as important, if not more important than, than Mark, which is his wife, Laura. And um, so, yeah, I, I know, Allison, you kind of been looking into her work. I hate to it, interrupt. Yes. <laughs> Go ahead. Are you, are you getting a signal? Yeah, our th the connection is terrible. I can hardly hear you. Oh, no. Okay. I can't hear you. Like, it's like, I can hear you, but it's like really super slow robot voice let me lower your thing uh I'm, I, sure. I'm really choppy i don't know okay uh i just lowered your resolution so i don't know if that helps at all that, that i'm sending back to you uh so how can you hear me now okay yeah i can i can hear you is that a little bit better okay yeah it'll just make it harder for you to see the slides but um it's hopefully cool. we'll, we'll we'll just we'll play it by ear we'll work it around um yeah, for some reason, <laughs> uh, technology doesn't like what we're doing. <laughs> um, yeah, so what I was saying, Allison, was that, that there's another person associated with Mark who is just as important or maybe even more important that you, you'd been following her work for a long time, which is Mark's wife, uh, Laura. And uh, how right. do you say her name? Ala, Ala, uh, I always get I get confused by saying say her last name. Aralaga. Aralaga. I don't know. It's, it's her husband. I don't know if it's Arayaga. I mean, I don't know if it's Spanish or it's Basque originally, but um, mm. yeah, I say Aralaga. So could be wrong. Yeah. So uh, it wouldn't be. Yeah. So I. Go ahead. Just it... the connection is so bad. Oh no. Um. Go ahead. Never Sad. mind. <laughs> Is this going to, are they going to, they're throwing a monkey wrench. They're, I just can't, you know, like they're not. They're yeah, throwing, no, no, a, they're throwing a wrench in our gears. <laughs> yeah. Um, shoot. Okay. Uh, imagine that you don't have an internet connection. Uh, well, I mean, we can try. I think conversation, like our back is not going to work well because the, the connection is not good. But I can okay. talk for a while and then I can what? stop and you can talk. Enough. Well, I, I, I've got the slides here. We're kind of uh, talking. So I brought, I brought your slides up. Why, why don't you just go ahead and start and I might jump in and maybe in a little while it'll clear up where we can actually have uh, some back and forth. The conversation. Yeah. Yeah. yeah so, um, you know, after we had that, that, that initial um, discussion about the, the Rogan interview, I mean, I think part of what we're trying to do at this stage is help provide some guidance in terms of analyzing media content 
because all of this stuff that's floating around out there right now is is put out with a, a real intention. And some of it is what's said, a lot of it is what is not said. And that's something that I think we're trying to do with our new discussion board that we've got that you, know, you might mention later, but we have a whole category of like uh, information warfare sort of deconstruction. And as I was going through this, let me see if I can get to the, um, part of the thing is, Mark Andreessen's focus, and this is something that like Leo Saracino has been looking into, is a lot of the, the blockchain financialization of the commons, right? Of the, the sustainable finance, regenerative finance, and that work. And that's all happening through blockchain tokenization and these internet of everything sensors uh, technology that's coming in, the Web3 stuff. And so that's, that's what's on its way. But before that could all happen, there needed to be the infrastructure put in place to um, allow the impact finance space to, to grow. And, and these folks have a really long time horizon. And so a lot of the policy work that's being put in place, as we know, it happens through um, you know, largely academic institutions and think tanks that are funded, funded through you know, philanthropy that's you know, corporate money that's channeled into these uh, philanthropic vehicles to set the policy, to create the game that's happening. Now, um, Laura Aralaga Andresen, her function in, and what I was familiar with was in the policy space at Stanford University. And um, what she was about was setting up data-driven philanthropy, to set up the narrative around, um, you know, the problem with nonprofit finance is, um, uh, that we don't have enough information or we don't know who to trust or we don't know what's effective. And so the narrative that was being spun out was that, which would essentially create the opportunity for uh, the internet of everything, the data analytics dashboards around the sustainable development goals, around poverty alleviation, uh, supposedly, and around uh, sustainability and climate and all of the offsets that are coming for um, you know, carbon offsets and biodiversity offsets. And so what I, we've called this sort of the techno makeover of the third sector. The third sector is the nonprofit sector. And it is that area that's being remade for public private partnerships that will run this sort of global cybernetic uh, program, a gamified program of sort of managed behavior change into you know, seeming potentially the next level of evolution, which is what I want to talk about. So I'm going to start off a little bit, giving a little bit of Laura's backstory. And then um, later on, we're going to deconstruct an article from 2015 that she wrote for the Stanford Social Innovation Review that she helped found because she essentially created impact finance at Stanford, which is a driving force in uh, data analytics for social impact finance. Uh, but then chunked in the middle was something I worked on earlier this morning and you know me i'm always i can never get a slide deck that's under 100 slides so we'll see how far we get today and if we need to take a break but the, the middle chunk that i put in i was there, there's a particular bit of artwork that goes along with this article she wrote in 2015 and it has a lot to do with hearts and network networked hearts really um and altruism and values and for me that linked really directly into some earlier research that i've done but haven't really yet published on about the uh, foundation for integrated education and Peter Sorapkin, um, who uh, was a part of that and his center for creative altruism and so th sort of the middle section that i want to talk about is about laura aralaga um I won't necessarily even say her as an individual because what I'm imagining now are these people are sort of archetypes. They're playing roles in this larger drama, but that uh, th that Laura Aralaga Andresen, the role that she is playing in terms of creating a, a, a broadly spun narrative that we are all philanthropists, that we all can share our values through exchanging of tokens and making our values visible to the machine is a direct extension of some earlier work around applied sociology and high level theoretical physics that was done um, in the post World War II era. So that's sort of gonna, gonna be the middle chunk. So yeah, so we're talking about the techo, techno makeover of the third sector. And that's something I would encourage if people aren't already familiar with um, the social impact finance space and the work that we've been doing around it. Uh, Sir Ronald Cohen um, is, is, was the leader in talking about the need to remake the third sector for sort of stakeholder capitalism. So let's see if that, oh look, 
look, oh, it worked. So Jason's got some new tricks. So now I can actually control the slides from my end, which is great. So this is just an, an image of Laura. And th this is from like 10 years ago, I think on, on the left. Uh, Mark Andres and her husband has got the glass of iced tea next to her. And um, you've got Mark Zuckerberg. So her husband, Mark Andresen, is on the board of Meta and very much about um, this idea that there is reality privilege and in the future, most of us are gonna spend our time in the metaverse. And then on the right hand side is uh, Laura's uh, father who I think died just this past year. Uh, he was a, a scholarship student and athlete in basketball at Stanford uh, and then eventually made his fortune in developing corporate real estate in and around Silicon Valley and is one of Stanford's largest donors. I think there are at least four different uh, uh, buildings on the campus that are named after him. And it's interesting because if you, you haven't yet seen the work, read the work that I've done lately on uh, Mondragon Cooperative in Spain and Basque Cooperatives, um, actually the, the Aralaga name is is of Basque origin. That, those are his family roots. And um, for a while when, when John Aralaga was playing basketball uh, at Stanford, and I think maybe semi-pro, he played for a basketball team uh, in Spain, in in the Basque region, I think during the 1960s. So so that's kind of interesting in the overall global networked scene. So that just situates her. Uh, you can see that I, I've been in this game for a bit. I mean, not hugely long time, but I've been writing on the social impact financing at least you know, since 2016. A lot of, in the Silicon Val Valley, these these innovative crypto finance structures uh, since uh, 20. 18, and that's uh, on the left is an image of one of the blog posts I did that was linking uh, social impact finance pay for success pilot projects that ha were happening in Santa Clara, California. So a little bit outside the Bay Area, um, uh, pay for success projects in uh, uh, early childhood education and uh, housing, uh, mental health, and uh, literacy. So. Laura Auralaga wasn't directly connected with that, but like due to her role at Stanford, she was both a graduate student and then became a professor and lecturer there on social impact finance. She would be very well aware of these pilot programs because that those were the sorts of projects that she was advocating for and they were happening right in her backyard. So let's see the next slide. Okay, so then in 2011, she wrote a book called um, essentially Remaking Philanthropy. That was that the plan was to remake uh, the uh, philanthropy field. Sorry, I'm just trying to look at my own copy of the slides. So it's a little bit clearer. Um, there, there was an article in the Washington Post talking about reinventing philanthropy with the Sally blueprint. Okay, so this is what is needed for Web3 and broad scale financialization of life on planet Earth through behavioral analytics is that we, we need to uh, explain to people um, a nice way that we're going to manage every aspect of their lives. And I think the, the idea that's going to be is that we all philanthropists, we all care about, we all have deeply held values, we care about different things. Um, and through these new forms of collective uh, participation with to tokenizing behaviors that we can sort of uplift the issues that we care about. And in doing so, all of this is actually linked back to sort of open signals intelligence, open source signals intelligence that is informing larger simulation and sort of homeostatic governance processes um, run by machines. So the machine is more and more understanding what our values are. And I think what we've seen in the past 10 to 15 years is an amplification of really the identity politics space across the continuum and an intentional use of social media to polarize and amplify uh, signals about what people's values are often in opposition to other people's values and in that the the philanthropic space will play into that as as well so the narrative they wouldn't want to sell you is that everyone is going to have a chance to be a philanthropist. Um, the reality is that this whole program is being run by massive aggregations of global capital in the form of, you know, UBS Bank, Deutsche Bank, BlackRock, Blackstone. Those people are going to be channeling their 
assets through uh, environmental social governance, ESG investing, and they're going to be running the game. It is their game that they have structured, but they would like to keep us busy sort of with the small potato token uh, tossing uh, programs of quote unquote, like grassroots philanthropy and advocacy uh, to keep us busy so that we're not gumming up their works. Um, you know, it's sort of definitely a David and Goliath program, but also as we are kept busy in our philanthropy and activism around our smaller issues, uh, we are making ourselves more and more visible to the machine. So um, one of the key players that I mentioned before is Petirum Sorapkin, um, and he, he was a Harvard professor of applied sociology uh, back in the 1950s. And he was later endowed with a whole center for creative altruism by uh, Eli Lilly, actually, the big pharmaceutical company that is is very strongly also gives through their foundation to to Christian uh, philanthropy. So it's both the pharmaceuticals and religious based. Uh, but he was very interested in this idea of altruism. And again, I, I'm I'm thinking as I see it that the archetype of Laura Alvarez Andresen is directly connected to the characters represented by Pichurim Sorapkin, whose father was incidentally a Russian icon painter, that they want to quantify altruism. They want to turn it into a science, a science of morality, a science of goodness, not just any sort of squishy thing that we feel in our emotions, but actually like a rational, logical structure. And he wrote a book called The Reconstruction of Humanity. And if you've been following along my more recent work on this, you'll see that, you know, beyond the data aggregation, both for profit and for systems engineering and uh, prediction markets and digital simulations, I do believe that there are some people who imagine that they're going to get enough data about both the, the molecular biology of our lives and the, the our social interactions, both with one another and the environment, that they're going to push us into some sort of new stage of evolution that is going to be more of a collective consciousness, hive mind consciousness program. And so the title of this book that that I, I screenshot, it's available on the Wayback Machine, is called The Reconstruction of Humanity. And so I do think that there is an intention to deconstruct the, the somewhat flawed, imagined flawed version of humanity that we have. And this is all happening in, in Sorotkin's time against the backdrop of uh, the, the atomic bombs being dropped, World War II, this idea of you know, mass de devastation, and that we will reconstruct what it is to be human through a logical positivist altruism or philanthropy in the post-war era and become our better selves. So I'm just going to read the line that I underlined um, here, and it says, uh, altruism preached but not practiced is a sham or hypocritical pseudo-altruism. Real altruism must manifest itself not merely in speech, reactions, and ideology, but in overt action. And so this is going to come into play in just a minute. We're going to go into a bit of uh, a media kerfluffle that has happened with the Andresen family around affordable housing in the Bay Area. So I'll, I'll pause for a second. Jason, did you want to chime in? Oh, no, I was just, uh, I'd taken myself off the screen because I was just do, doing technical stuff back here. Um, yeah, I don't have anything to chime in right now. I, I, I will in a minute, though. <laughs> okay. All right. So here, let me go to the next slide. Oh, did I lose that? Oh, there it is. Sorry. I have two screens going. I'm getting more advanced. At this. <laughs> I only have one laptop, so I have like a little screen of my slide. So anyway, when I was talking about the book, The Reconstruction of Humanity, this is the slide of the book. And I'll share out a, a, a link to the slide share after if you guys want to read it. There, there's quite a bit of this early stuff around um, early theoretical physics and sort of molecularly engineered utopias and crystallography. A lot of these books are in the Wayback Archive that you can read firsthand from like the 1890s through the 1920s and 30s. And it's, it's definitely well worth your time. So there's the Sorapkin book. And then the, the next one is just in terms of why we decided to talk about this today and some things that came together. My Our friend Lynn, Lynn was in on the conversation we had about Mark Andreessen before, and she had shared an article, I, I, again, I think this is the Washington Post from this week, about foundations issuing social bonds um, and the role that the pandemic uh, played in catalyzing um, these massive foundations, the Rockefeller and Ford Foundation in particular, but also the Bush Foundation and the California Endowment to mobilize huge amounts of money into social issues. 
right? And, um, you know, I think it points out these issues were generally aligned with ESG, environmental social governance investment products, which is the new stakeholder capitalism economy. And, you know, again, that's not to say that the issues that are being addressed are not real, but I've had some challenges even in the organizing I was doing in advance of the lockdowns here in Philadelphia, which is a place with many, many social concerns uh, that uh, the, I'm trying to think, Reverend Barber's campaign, um, the the poor, poor people's campaign. The Poor People's Campaign, yeah. Um, you know, they they were funded through the Keros Foundation uh, at the uh, Union Theological Seminary, and their money was coming through the Ford Foundation. Like that was, and and there are so many, I think, well, very well-intended people, uh, especially because this was an interfaith effort around poverty uh, that's been rolling for quite some time. I don't know, five, maybe 10 years, really picking up, street, up steam. And, you know, I kept saying, I'm sorry, but the Ford Foundation is not funding any sort of revolutionary movement to fix poverty. <laughs> I mean, that's not what's happening here. And so the, the challenge I found is that working with people to understand that the issues are real. Like I, I'm here and I can tell you in Philadelphia, the issues of mental illness, housing insecurity, food insecurity, um, addiction, um, disinvestment in education, those are all very real problems. But I don't have any confidence that social impact finance, especially data driven social impact finance is going to be the answer here. And of course, we know Washington Post is owned by Bezos. And so, you know, we're, what we need to look at is the way in which philanthropy and these uh, social finance investments are being layered into authentic issues along with the cybernetics, along with the governance mechanisms, along with coded behavior and control systems, because I think we've got to get a handle on it. I've, I've been speaking out for a very long time around social impact bonds and pay for success finance and saying the data that these things run on will electrify and irradiate the entire world and put everyone under surveillance. And I don't think at the end of the day, they have any intent to solve the problem because they're actually making a profit on it and as soon as you create, make poverty and trauma a profit stream, it's never going to get fixed. Right. Um, I want to just say something. I've kind of been reading the comments, and this is one of the challenges that Alice and I have always had, because we'll read the comments and we'll be like, are people actually listening to what we're saying? It's like the, <laughs> the discussions on the comment thread are quite often totally different conversations. By the way, if I'm much louder than Allison, uh, please let me know because I can't really monitor. I've got little uh, meters, but they don't really do a very good job of telling me, you know, how it actually sounds. So let me know how the audio sounds like uh, uh, my is worth. But anyways, I just wanted to say that, like, if you guys, you know, we want you to join in and listen to us. But, like, please listen to us. Like, this is actually, like, Allison and I put a lot of time and work into putting this presentation together. And um, I just I don't I just look over the comment section and uh, like almost every time the co the the discussion is is not not related to what we're talking about. So I don't, I'm not trying to chastise you all. I love you all, but like I don't know. We, we're putting a lot of work into trying to like show you guys stuff that's going on here. Um, anyways, I just thought I'd throw that out there. I'm gonna be a, be a little naughty and <laughs> and gripe a little bit. Well, we're um, trying. I mean. Some of it is, I mean, it's the communication and people, it's like exercising new muscles. And I'm not a right. great exercise person to say that, but like you, you actually have to build up some stamina for this. Right. Plus, it's I would like to know what people think. I would like to know what everybody yeah. thinks about what we're presenting here. Uh, and so I'm always looking over to, to get some interesting feedback and I just, it doesn't seem to appear. <laughs> anyway. All right. Go ahead. Okay. Well, I think that's enough. I think people sort of understand where I'm coming from, from impact. The Rockefeller and Ford Foundations are not here to actually solve poverty. Newsflash. OK, but this is just coming out this week. And clearly they're getting airplay because this is going to be how it works, is that we are you show what your value through how you direct your money. Um, OK, so this is. So my background is, so this is the article that we, we're going to eventually deconstruct. Um, I, I have a friend who actually was the one who 
uh, sort of put me onto the, the track of all the stuff that was going on in Santa Clara County uh, and was aware of uh, the Silicon Valley uh, Community Foundation's role and Stanford's role in sort of setting up data-driven philanthropy and the public-private partnerships. Uh, I saw it from an inside view. And so that's why this has really been on my radar since 2018. It would not have been otherwise. Now, the Stanford Social Innovation Review has many, many social impact articles. It's based in Stanford. Um, Laura Aralaga Andresen helped create the center where it's housed. Uh, and this is an article, again, rather dated at this point. It's 2015. So, and it's called Disruption for Good. And uh, let's see. I'll just read it for anybody who's listening on the right. It says, disruption for good, rapid advances in technology are changing philanthropy in fundamental ways, making it potentially more rational, effective, collaborative, transparent, and democratic. And this is from the spring issue of 2015. And, you know, the, the image that went along with it, it, it made an impression on me initially, and then it re I sat with it, and it ended up opening a whole new discussion. So if some of this stuff doesn't resonate, hang with me because as I was telling Jason, I said, I don't have all of this pinned down, but I have a feeling just in my gut that it's really important and I want other people to know it besides me. <laughs> so that has some walking, maybe other people have other pieces of this puzzle. But I think if you look at this image, what you see is sort of a constellation of figures. Um, of different sizes, they're connected and networked in lines. Most of them are all holding what look to be, I think, a, a symbol of a phone, a personal phone, and it's glowing yellow. So it's, um, and where their hands are holding it is generally in front of their heart. And then these people are situated on a heart. <laughs> And so I know that there is something really vital about how do I say it? Um, like we are ma currently material beings. <laughs> we are living out this moment as material beings. We are bioelectric beings, right? We are this constellation of microbes and crystals and water and all of these amazing things that come together. And yet we have, we do have this soul, right? We have this aura, we have an essence. The heart is really important in all of that. We know that a lot of the, the harms that have happened over the past couple years relating to medical stuff relate to heart, are heart related. Um, there's this push lately for uh, heart regu regulation, uh, meditation, mindfulness, wearables around heart rate are increasingly important. And a lot of the work that I've been doing over the past month, and I, I hope, I think Jason and Leo and I are gonna be presenting on it in a couple more weeks, is around uh, the use of radioactive isotopes in ecological systems and tracking metabolic processes and interactions across broad environments. And this was done in the 1950s in Oak Ridge uh, National Lab uh, in conjunction with the Atomic Energy Commission. So when I see like these glowing phone phones in the place of your heart, and I think what they're trying to communicate, at least with respect to this article, is that you show your values by how you interface with your device. And so you show that you care by almost kind of standing alone. They're a bit crowded, but you get the sense that there's this social distance, that these are unique agents, like learning agents. That's another thing I've been spending some time on is I just got on Steffer's recommendation, this great book on swarm intelligence and AI. Um, so these are almost like swarm agents with their tracking devices that are expressing to the world their values and their position of philanthropy. And so to me, this image was a launching point for the next bit that I'm going to talk about. So I'm going to go on to the next slide. OK, so this is uh, Laura Aralaga's book that she uh, put out in it's over a decade now. Right. So 2011, it was called Giving 2.0. And so a lot of what we're seeing now is that our lifestyles are supposed to be um, run on operating systems, right? Like smart cities have an operating system. Your philanthropy has an operating system. Like this is the next version of philanthropy. 
And, you know, she had a lot of people at her book launch at Stanford, um, including the Gordon and, and Betty Moore Foundation. And when you've heard of like Moore's Law about the chips, you know, and information and chips, yeah, it's that Moore. Uh, the Hoover Institution, now she was an advisor and a fellow at the Hoover Institution, I believe on her that board for a while. And something that I've been looking into and I would really recommend um, Jen Lake's blog. Um, it's, I think, Jen Lake's blog and Polio Forever at WordPress. She's been doing a lot of work for over a decade into uh, the use of radiation um, in testing, fallout, medicine, um, in a way that really melds with what we're doing around now the the, the, the tracked impact finance space in the global brain. And if, if you want to find the blogs, both um, the work that Jen's doing and Steffers and Leo, uh, at the bottom of our new discussion board, it's called, it's a discourse. It's a wonderful like Linux based server that, um, and I think maybe uh, Jason can like link to it or something in a comment or the blog, like our new thing. Um, those blogs are all linked at the bottom. So anyway, I just want to give a shout out and say like the Hoover Institution is important there. Yeah. So you can, you can see some of the work we're doing. It's a bit out there right now, uh, but in the, in the bottom it has the links to the blogs of people on the, in the group and where they're posting at. So Hoover Institution is really vital because Herbert Hoover, uh, when he, before he was Allison, president, quick. he hired Hang on real quick. I just want to, uh, while you were on the discourse thing, I was reading the comments. Some people were making comments about it that they weren't really sure what it is. And I just really, real quick, just let me just reiterate. I mean, some of you guys watched the video and maybe I wasn't very clear on it. Um, you know, we, we created this, this uh, discussion group to be very focused. And yes, we, I'm not like just letting anybody on there. And the reason why is because we're trying to have a very focused conversation about all these things, all these things that we're, we're presenting on. And a lot of times people are wanting to have uh, different discussions. And, I'm not, and, and a lot of those other different discussions are actually important. I think some of them are also a distraction. And I do know for a fact that there are campaigns, coordinated, orchestrated campaigns uh, that are going on in order to disrupt uh, not just us, but other people, anyone who's challenging the narrative out there. And so with people online, you never know who, who they are. You know, you have, like I said, you know, comments that are hap happening on different social media that um, I think try to steer people in different directions. And we're just trying to have a very specific conversation. And we want to have anybody that wants to c join in that conversation and wants to have that conversation with us, we, want, we would love to have you uh, uh, participate. Um, but I, I, I am kind of being a little particular about who, who comes, comes into that. And, and again, every, everything that we do on there is open to the public. So all the research that we do, anyone can read it. Uh, everyone's welcome to use it, share it. Um, put it into their own work and uh, whatnot. But that's the idea behind it. And I think it's pretty reasonable. I think the idea that we're trying to create a curated space is actually very reasonable. And in fact, I think other people, if they want to have other conversations that aren't necessarily our conversations, I think everybody should move away from social media. Everyone should create their own, whether it's discourse or another bulletin board or something, um, you know, I think it takes a little, there's a little bit of a learning curve and, it, you know, have to change a little about how, how you, how you approach it. But I think everyone should start doing that. Like we should, we need to start, you know, not just relying on, I mean, obviously we're, we're dependent. I mean, we're here, we're on YouTube. We're, we're still dependent on big tech and we're always going to be because this whole tech, the whole, the entirety of the technology is, is not ours really. Um, at the end of the day, but you know we can try to maybe carve out some spaces where we can have some discussions, and that's what that's about. And again, like if you want to join that, um, excuse me, you can send me an email, um, uh, and I'm actually going to have a little questionnaire. I'm, I'm I'm creating a formal questionnaire to kind of find out where people are at. I'm going to try to have a conversation with you by phone. You know, I want to know who everybody is. That's that's that's. Um, that's going to be contributing, but it's not like the, the point of it's not to be elitist or anything like that. It's just because we're desperately, desperately trying to have a conversation about all this research that we're doing. Um, and so that's what that's all about anyway. So carry on Allison. <laughs> yeah. I would just say like, don't take it personally if it doesn't end up because we're, I think many people out there are looking for numbers. It's always been, unity, numbers, more, more, more. And I think ours is sort of a less is more. And not that if for some reason it, you don't end up 
being a part of it, it's not a reflection on you as a person. It's just our process. And so, I mean, it's a bit awkward in the, like navigating how to be create these spaces in online because we've not, it's a weird, it's artificial. It's a totally artificial society. It's not normal. Um, yeah. And, yet, and I don't want to be that person. Like, I don't want to be like, <laughs> Oh, this is our club or anything. But I'm like, we've been trying to have these conversations for two and a half years. And, and, you know, a, a few people, there's a handful of people out there that are, are kind of getting where we're, where we're going with this. But most people are trying to have different conversations, whether they're doing that just genuinely, like, that they don't really understand the importance and the irrelevance of, of what we're presenting here, or that they're actually trying to um, misdirect and, 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 and muddy the waters. So I think both things are happening. But anyways, we're just trying to create a curated space where we're really focused on, um, on, on these issues. So, uh, and, and that, and, and again, I encourage other people to, to create their own spaces too. I think that we need to get, get away from, uh, um, we need to get away from the, the social media for sure. Yeah. Anyway, all right. All right, so back to Laura and her book, her book launch. Stanford's very well represented. Um, uh, the this Silicon Valley Social Venture Fund, which she helped found, uh, she pitched the Silicon Valley Community Foundation that incubated that um, while she was at Stanford in the MBA program. The Skoll Foundation, very major in sustainability spaces. Uh, Irvine, Packard, uh, William and Flora Hewlett, um, all very much in the human capital impact finance space. And I would say there, there's this, I'm going to talk a little bit more about Hewlett Packard later. And then the Tides Foundation, which is sort of a, a liberal progressive clearinghouse for a lot of um, more progressive pools of money into, into other spaces. So um, she had a lot of people backing her on her book launch. And again, this was back in 2011. So... So now I'm going to get over to, uh, to uh, Pitram Sarapkin, and this is who I mentioned before. Um, this is a book. It's a very cheesy cover. Now, I, I, will, I will tell you, he was a, a professor for decades of applied sociology at Harvard. So please so, sort of disregard the cheesiness of the, the cover on Amazon. But you know, I thought that this was a useful description. It's a revisiting. So the ways of power and love. And I think power, a lot of the stuff we need to consider a, this the more I'm looking into uh, radio ecology and economies of energy and metabolism, that when we see power, we should think of circuits and energy exchange. Um, the, the end of the description says that he was looking to turn uh, the science towards a study of love. So actually to turn love into a science. And that's sort of the framework that I think when we're looking at, um, let me see, I'm trying to go previous. Um, when we're looking at this image, right, the image of the people networked with the phones in their hearts, the science of love, like if there's anything that speaks to sort of like turning the, the, the sort of wonders of love itself, like in the many facets into something that is standardized and understood in a decentralized network fashion, like to me, it's that, that image. And, you know, I was telling Jason last night, I was putting together some slides and I said, I need to figure out, remind myself which, who was talking about the heart mind synthesis. And I thought it was Riser, like I thought it was in the world sensorium and I'm looking through and Riser is very much about the world brain and the cephalization, like cephal, like a head, like coming together of all the world's people through sort of a united one world government. But I couldn't find the heart stuff. And then I realized that the heart stuff was with Sorapkin and Fritz Kunst, who was the lead on theosophy in North America. And he was one of the key figures in this foundation for integrated education. And so I, I spent the time this morning to go hunt down the letters that talked about that and that, and then it just opened everything up because if you if you understand that love like the science of love literally the science of love and morality i think that that is what is at the heart of this techno philanthropic blockchain token simulation it is it is like ai wanting to know love and that's what it thinks love looks like and this didn't come out of nowhere. Like Laura wrote her book in 2011, but it's built on the very foundations of Sorapkin, who was working in the 40s. So just to tell you a little bit about Pitra, and, and this is like, 
you know, who knows how many people are of his <laughs> frame, right? Um, it's this is his whole archive actually is at the University of Saskatchewan, which is interesting. Um, and they've scanned it, which is fabulous. Sometimes it goes offline and then I have to ask them to reboot it. But there many of the letters are scanned and available. So I would really encourage you to to, you know, when you when you go through, grab, go on the slide deck and click through the links and just see what these offerings are, because it's a really win a bit an important window into um, self-actualization, even like the underpinnings of the new age movement, but the, the, the technocracy of it. And while he was at Harvard, he had this idea that he was going to search for the incorruptibles. <laughs> and many of the people who were involved in this are also like ecumenical religious figures. So he was looking for the incorruptibles. And, you know, I'm just going to read this. This is from a clipping. Um, I can't read the one on the right. It's a bit too small, but it shows that this concept was also in the Harvard Crimson, right? So I can't tell of how much tongue in cheek it was and how accurate it was, but clearly the message was getting out in more than one forum about his search for incorruptibles. Um, the search for incorruptibles, Pitaram Sarapkin, Harvard sociologist, believes that the elements of culture fluctuate, advancing and retreating, but never getting anywhere. Dismayed by today's soft living and moral laxity, Professor Sorapkin last week proposed a search for young incorruptibles who would be trained to be political leaders. The incorruptibles would be trained in a university where they would lead a monastic life far away from the temptations and allures of normal living. Most revolution, the most revolutionary part of the university would be the entrance exams. Taking them, the candidate would be placed in a suite of luxuriously furnished rooms filled with soft lounges, rich foods, and scantily clad girls from Hollywood. And the candidate would stay there for three days. And if during that time he had not succumbed to food or females, he would be able to enter the university. Presumably the passing grade in this temptations test would be 100%. And it's, I mean, in and of itself, that's sort of a silly um, excerpt, but I think it set, speaks a lot to like the control mechanism that was coming out of sort of the, the world war, scientific, theoretical physics program that you could reprogram life itself, like that you could have the answer to what the right kind of living was and that you could control all of these facets and that you would you would groom a group of leaders that would do that even though and i you know i'm not here to say that you should overindulge or you know in licentiousness but like the foundational driving aspects of life are you know sexuality and sustenance you know those are at the the core of what it is to be this material thing so if these folks are literally trying to remove that from the equation as an inco incorruptible item like to me that almost really starts to feel like avatars right like you you literally are creating a simulation world where the the drives of the material are irrelevant right they, and, and and but to me that that's camisots if any of you guys listen to my reading of a wrinkle in time like it's this technocratic cold existence so well i always yeah, i also yeah i also think about like the the narrative that we're always told about human nature and how human nature is just naturally greedy and selfish and that's why we need all these systems in place to to keep ourselves in check and and, and i i've always kind of questioned that narrative because i look around and i see people in spite of actual rewards for being selfish you know often being very generous and kind and and it's almost like the systems themselves um actually encourage <laughs> a lot of those values in people or lack of but um and i think that like the people like the people with power like that's how they are and so they kind of project on the rest of uh, humanity um i don't know just those are some thoughts that i was thinking um, also, I upped yeah. your your quality, so hopefully that helps because I noticed the your connection's a little bit better now. So, oh, good, good. Um, yeah, they saw that we persevered. We had grit, so they they. <laughs> um, well, and the thing is, again, this is at the highest levels of society, right? And so these things sound ridiculous, and yet they're out there. And I, I really feel that the history is something that we need to look at more closely because it it's not disconnected from what we're seeing today. So let me go on to the next slide. 
so this is an image uh, from a paper that was talking about Sorapkin's work. Uh, it was more recent, I think maybe in the 90s, but, but they were talking about uh, his applied research center, uh, the Research Center in Creative Altruism at Harvard, and that it's, it's, the program was to study creative altruism and indicate how it can be used by applied sociologists today. And they were talking about his work being used to influence species consciousness. And, and I do think that that does, again, reflect somewhat of the, the world sensorium and the, 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 the hive mind, like the elevated consciousness. And, you know, many people talk about ascension or age of Aquarius or raised consciousness itself. And, you know, I'm not against practicing being more self-aware, but I think that guided consciousness with right technologies is very troublesome. And so it's, I think it's important context. And I mentioned this earlier, you can see on the right, it says with the help of uh, philanthropist Eli Lilly and others, uh, Sorapkin founded the center to combat the exclusive role played by sensate belief and practices in contemporary society. In his place, he sought to promote behavior based on altruistic values and integralism. And I think that's the foundation for integrated education. That's the integralism, which combines three ways of knowing uh, the, 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 sensate, the sensory, the rational, and the super rational. And that, that through that, that way, they would transform society through this integralism. And so I do feel like when Mark Andreessen speaks of reality privilege, that really it's better to live in the internet in the metaverse because you can have a much richer variety of experiences for people of all economic levels than being in the material world that that is correlated to this idea that we should seek to escape the sensory and move into sort of hyper rational because it, within the hyper rational i think in the metaverse world people often imagine it and maybe if you're coding, you feel like you have more control, but maybe it's playful or exploratory or adventurous, or it has all of these offerings. But the reality is, it's all encoded. It's encoded with, you know, the kind of algorithms that are in this book about swarm consciousness, like genetic algorithms and weighted decisions and decision trees and values. Everything is already predetermined with different variables, just waiting for it to play out, like depending on when you show up on the scene. But it's, it's, it's already set and it's it's not set by you know a sacred creative intelligence of the universe that's set by a coder or some like behavioral military psychologist you know to drive your behavior that's where it's at so you know you can talk about being super rational or hyper rational but in the end what i think laura or like andreessen and mark andreessen and mark zuckerberg's plan is that the the, the, what they're selling as hyper rational is really incredibly manipulative and deceptive and yet like pulls people in into this this ideal that they can be an ideal person in the metaverse the way they can't be ideal in their material selves because of their ego or their greed or you know their flaws or the their their body shape or you know how they think or their intelligence like they can't be the good person in the real world but they could be they could ev evoke that in the metaverse well i can't remember who said it but it was there was a quote uh we are living in a material world and i'm a material girl uh that just comes to mind <laughs> sorry i <laughs> don't throw a little humor in here um sorry yeah, i know i'm not so good at the humor no it's all right so, and, oh gosh, I'm not gonna. Can you see that here? I, uh, let me. I can't see it. It's too, my eyes are too old. Um, okay, so this, this was, uh, you can see, this is in his archive, so it's nice, confidential. So, you know, 70 years later, not so confidential, but this is the proposal for the development of the Center for Creative Altruism. And they were talking about um, developing a moral phenomenon um, moral phenomena and values, a science, the science of human values. It was built off of a conference that was held at MIT in 1957 called the Conference on New Knowledge and Human Values. And um, the people who participated in that conference, which later became a book that you can see on the right, and I'll hop out in a minute when I can see it a little bit better, but this among the speakers were um, Ludwig von Bertalaffy, who was sort of the father of general systems theory. And he was I believe in Vienna, um, and 
he at one point was allied with the, the Nazis and he was very much an uh, implementer of the circular economy. And his, uh, he currently has an institute in his name that's run by Alexander Laszlo, Irvin Laszlo's son uh, in Vienna for the circular economy. So the Barton Laffey being part of that was really important. And then also Robert Hartman that I'm gonna speak about a little bit more later. Uh, Henry Marginow, who was a physicist at Yale, who was the chair of the Foundation for Integrated Education. Again, a very influential figure. Um, Abraham Mao, and then you, you see Sorokin there. So those uh, lectures were compiled in a book that was later published and went through several editions that was, it was edited by Maslow himself. And so again, it's a hierarchy of needs of self-actualization, but if you understand it within a cybernetic construct, that you are being monitored, governed, watched within all of this um, in a game of like increasingly gamified Internet of Things networked, although decentralized um, system. It's almost like your karmic self, you know, undergoing having to learn these lessons, but learning them in a panopticon and then having the game like boost you or nudge you or, you know, hold you back at different times. So I feel like that the whole self-actualization piece is part of the game, but it's it's increasingly becoming a mechanical game and not a um, not a karmic game, if that makes sense. So um, yeah, so I'll move on to the next slide here. Okay, so this is this is a this is a letter from Fritz Kunst to Sorokin, and this is in the archives. You can see the letterhead, the Foundation for Integrated Education, Inc., uh, which is on East 42nd Street in New York. This is 1949. And I'm just going to read, I'm going to go ahead and read this letter because I told Jason, like, I, I, I need this letter to be out there so that other people have it. And I haven't really figured out, I definitely haven't figured out all of what he's saying in this letter. But I feel like the letter is a key to unlocking a lot of the secrets that are linking um, sort of field theory and sort of space-time continuum and applied sociology and ecology and sort of radio isotope tracking, nanoparticle tracking, like within the system. So again, all the way back to 1949, I'm going to go ahead and just read it so it's out there. Um, so it starts off, Dear Dr. Dr. Sorokin, it is now possible for me to make some comments on points in your interesting letter of February 11th, however brief they must be. The fact is that the material I have should be shown and discussed. It would save much labor and would be helpful to your important enterprise. I think that's the, the center that comes later. Let me say first that if tenor, tensors, if tensors are introduced in the usual sense, parentheses, as next in the series, scalar vector, close parentheses, you will need to set up some axiom, axioms as to points, lines, and planes, parentheses, at the very least, in their sociological frame of reference, parentheses. This is what Moreno is trying to do. Now that's Jonathan Moreno's father who developed sociograms and was later, I think, involved in MK Ultra work. For the five classes you mention, and the sixth, which I suggested, will have to embody uniform geometric or algebraic criteria. How can this be done without resting the notion in part on my proposals? Man is embedded in nature. So I would say I read this probably about eight months ago, and it was kind of overwhelming because I didn't have the same level of knowledge that I have been building up lately. I do think if we imagine how we are represented in online media transactions, like that we are like the dots of the people in the heart with the devices, like series of interconnections and exchanges and data so that we are represented mathematically in code as these digital twins. Like it somehow, like, and I, I didn't actually, well, I did download my, tw my Twitter when I left Twitter. I didn't do Facebook. Like, I don't know what all of that data looks like on the back end in terms of metadata, but it's, it's incredibly robust. And it's something that we clearly needed to reach a point of having very high level supercomputing to analyze and create these twin situations. But I think vectors and studying people, studying life and values across time and space in the fourth dimension 
is what these digital twin models are for, is, is aggregating um, the data across a time frame and project it forward based on predictive behavior. And that's part of these new, like Leo has been talking about the alpha bonds and bonding curves, that that's what's coming. So turning people into a mathematical framework within a field of motion, like both a, a field of different kinds of layers of sociological exchange, including you know, behavioral, psychosocial, financial, and then building off of that uh, through these, these socio sociogram constructs. So here it mentions five classes, and then towards the end I'll show you, it looks like there was a later letter about experimenting with some classes in New Jersey. <laughs> so I don't know if some students in New Jersey in the 50s got some sort of sociological workup, but I can imagine that like we, we understand that most of these social media platforms are coming out of a defense, military, physics probably um, context. And if so, maybe to me, I, I, I read that and I think, okay, those are the progeny of this way of looking at the world that we're we're looking to understand human sociology across time and then if we can get these planes and vectors and lines that 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 will be our way to start to represent the meaning behind a life lived in a technical form jason did you have anything you want to say sorry i muted myself uh no, that's just uh, just disturbing to think about. I mean, just it's hard to think that like you know, getting behind the mindset because it's it's so different than the way most of us think. And it's complicated. I mean, the thing is, I don't necessarily want to have to figure out this letter, but it feels like a key. I mean, if someone in 1949 is talking about applied sociology, especially like the scientific approach to love. Um, and they're talking about it in these terms, it feels like something that should be more broadly understood. <laughs> and I can see echoes, like I said, like Jonathan Moreno, the son of, I think the Moreno in this letter, he is a prominent bioethicist at the University of Pennsylvania. Like he's written books about, called Mind Wars on the military control of minds. And in that he talks about his father being involved with L MK Ultra experiments. His father ran like a mental institution with dissociative people in upstate New York to like figure this stuff out. And then actually his work in sociograms and mapping relationality was conveyed into the New York City drama scene as like psychodrama and like new group therapy programs. So well, this some... stuff, even though it seems loopy, isn't. Like it's embedded very deeply in policy and, and academic culture and circles that, that I think reverberates forward to regular people. Well, I think there's something fundamentally disconnected from life uh, and even love <laughs> in, in that approach and looking at it as a thing that you're going to dis dissect and then somehow manipulate and control or, you know, it's like it's, it seems like it's missing the essence of what it is you're trying to <laughs> control, you know. Yeah. Well, I think I mean, what I've kind of dawned on me this morning as I was putting these slides in, I feel like they're trying to reverse engineer it. I think right. that I think there's something that, that they want to be the creators of something and um, that they're looking to have to mine us for the data they need to do the reverse engineering to, to be, you know, Dr. Frankenstein or something. Yeah. Feels like. What if you force people or manipulate people into it? Like if, if people do the right thing for the wrong reasons, like. I guess it's it's okay in their minds, which I, and, and even wrapping my mind around that, because I, you know, clearly there are a lot of people that are just this is just talk. It's, it's just really about control and domination. They're not actually trying to make a better society, despite the rhetoric. Um, but I don't know. <laughs> well, so so just <coughs> so we know who. Oops. I can bring. That's not the next slide, I don't think. That's weird. Oh, did you use an older version, maybe? Uh, I, I refreshed it this morning. Did, when did you update it? Oh, no, I updated a lot. <laughs> I uh, updated it until right before. Right up oh, till, you know, I can, uh, I can <laughs> refresh it here. I'm, I may have to take over the, the control of it. Uh, okay. or, or, or create it, oh, give you a new, give you a new password, but give hang me a on new one code. Sec. I'm sorry. I, I, you know, me, I just get, 
Okay, let me just let enough. me just refer, let me refresh it because yeah, I'm probably just using. Uh, I'm probably just using a uh, another version of it that uh, I didn't realize yeah. you would. I, I, I think we this is what this is only an hour before we started. Too. I didn't know you were still adding stuff <laughs> right up to the last it. minute. <laughs> You know uh, me. I'm just okay. It's it's yeah. Did you see what right. number? Did you see what number you were on? It's fourteen. Yeah. Oh, 14. 14. There's fourteen. Yeah. Okay. Let yeah. me uh, see if we can reconnect you. I'm, I'm going to start present okay. with remote. I'm send me a new code. Uh, I may yeah. I may have to send you a new new code. Oh shoot. Thanks for your patience. Uh, uh, we're on. just trying our new. I'm going to do this so because I don't want to show the audience the code. Uh, not the. Oh okay. Uh, all right, copy. Don't use our secret remote control. Well, I, I, not that it would matter. They would take over our. They would take over our <laughs> slideshow. You would fast forward through all hundred slides. <laughs> <laughs> all right, one second here. Uh, one moment. Hang on. It gets interesting. This stuff. I mean, I had looked at this a long time ago, and I've been, like I said, sitting on the foundation for integrated education, and I think it's wild how looking at that one image that's connected to the article, it just told the whole story. And I think, and I, I will just say, you know, as we're trying to figure out next steps, because, you know, I don't think either Jason or I would be sticking with this. Clearly we're not in it for the money or the fame or fortune, but like, we feel like we have to do it. Like there's something that's driving us to unpack this story. Yeah. Um, when I, I, I'll just say something too. Like I'm, I've just been figuring that I'm constantly still figuring this stuff out. And so some people were looking at, I've had some people look at the, uh, um, at the new, the new forum discourse forum. And they're like, this is way over my head. Like this is way beyond my, my, you know, understanding. And I'm like, it, you don't have to understand all of it. You just have a, have the willingness to want to learn it. Cause like, I'm still trying to figure out like, most of the stuff that you're posting more recently is like totally new to me and I'm, I'm trying to trudge through it and figure it out. Um, Not and trudge, trudge. On. <laughs> <You're falling. laughs> uh, you know, but like I said, I didn't even know it's, I, I had, I'd never heard of impact finance, you know, two, two and a half years ago. So, you know, we learn, uh, but just be patient and, uh, we'll, we'll get there. So I think I, 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 We'll see if it's clicking. Do you want to see if I can okay. do I? Yep. Well, you're, this is this is it. So say, there you go. So you may have to jump jump to where you're at. I'm, I'm jumping. Right. Look, see. Oh, yay. Okay. So there we go. Thank you, Jason. So um, so this is Fritz Kunst, um, and he was sort of the 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 brains and the inertia behind the Foundation for Integrated Education, and that was happening with with Pitram Sorapkin and Harry, Henry Marginow at Yale and Julia Stolman and later Oliver Reiser. And his background was in theosophy. So he was sort of the lead for theosophy in North America. Uh, it was based, the theosophists, I'm trying to remember the name of the town. There's like a, a suburb of Chicago where their main temple is. And he was based outside of New York, I think in and around Scarsdale. And so he, helped publish uh, a, a magazine uh, for many years. I think it was called Fields Within Fields Within Fields with Stolman. And you can see this is an early post it's from a theosophist publication, but it's calling talking about jewels and crystallography. And, and when Jason talks a bit about, and I'm not gonna actually read off of this one, Jason, so that's okay, but um, like figuring out new things I think what you have to have to imagine and is just if you enjoy the chase. Now, not everybody enjoys the chase. I like chasing the pieces of the puzzle and I'm content to sort of look at bits and set them aside and know that they feel important and know that if I keep going, eventually there will be more things that more puzzle pieces that will, I'll find and it will start to the picture will come into focus. And so the I had looked into Kunst earlier. I had not been really looking into biophysics and and theoretical physics and and molecular engineering. And that's something because Leo has really been doing a, a dive into the the radio ecology aspect as it relates to the financialization and these cost offsets and carbon and biodiversity and agricultural insurance, and realizing that the U.S ecology movement, both educationally and policy wise, was embedded in the Atomic Energy Commission. Essentially, the entire ecological framework 
came out of that because um, as a result of the the fallout, the nuclear fallout, and they were like, oh, well, maybe we should figure out what happens when this irradiated material falls in the environment and see how it moves through it. And but they didn't really feel bad about it. In fact, they would they would pour radioactive waste in liners at Oak Ridge National Lab, like with no liners, like in lake beds and then plant on them. They would send out um, irradiated material so that you could irradiate seeds and grow atomic gardens. Uh, one of the key figures, uh, there were two brothers, the Odom brothers that created the field of ecology in the 1950s and 60s in the US. One was connected to the University of Georgia and the other to the University of Florida, Gainesville. And I'm trying to remember, it's H.T. Odom, I think it was Henry. During World War II, he was a meteorologist stationed in Puerto Rico, and he ended up leveraging his expertise and his time there in, in essentially irradiating a section of, of rainforest in Puerto Rico and studying the ecology of, of that there. And, and why that was important was that they were using nuclear waste that was to create radioisotopes that were initially fabricated at, in the um, Ernest Lawrence Laboratory at Berkeley in their cyclotron. And so there was a small economy of these radioisotopes, which I don't know. Oh, this one. This is an interesting book. I just finished this. I was went on a visit to, um, sorry, New Mexico, uh, Life Atomic, and it's about radioisotopes in medicine. But what the author, and this is a University of Chicago press book, was saying was that they needed a narrative in the radioisotope world to um offset like atoms for peace atoms to cure cancer atoms for medicine to offset the the arms buildup and so they needed it for a narrative control reason but then they also were using these irradiated molecules to unlock with their tools of electron microscopy to understand how metabolic processes worked to understand in greater detail how photosynthesis worked how energy transferred works and and what i'm going to get into a bit more later with with jason and leo is looking at thermal economics of energy transfer and this idea of not just the the, the technocracy that Patrick Wood talks about with this idea of maybe the socialists are coming to imply an energy based economy on on the US patriots, but literally that are that theoretical physicists at many levels in different countries were looking at molecular energy exchange has its own economic system as its own currency system, a currency of energy down to the molecule and the atom, and that seeing how energy flowed through ecological systems and engineering that like creating a, a systems engineering plan. And I think ultimately to try to catalyze this new evolutionary process or develop the, the AI Gollum stuff that they were doing. So it has everything to do with crystallography and biogeochemistry, which when you look back and knowing that these isotopes were all coming out of the Berkeley lab, um, it's not a surprise that Bergruen's Institute for Transforming the Human is about three miles from the Berkeley lab. It's right there because this history is all interconnected. So um, Jason, if we could just go back to the slides and that will maybe make a little bit more sense with um, Fritz Kunst, the Ray Jules in crystallography. He initially grew up in, um, in India uh, and spent time with Annie Besant in Adyar. Uh, the theosophist. And what was interesting, there was quite a bit of interest in Sarapkin's area around the yogis and their ability to uh, discipline their minds and control their heart rate and like stop their heart really. And so that's another heart element. So that they were looking at the physics of physiology um, and how to control that from the back end. And I think they're still doing that. Like I said, Bergruen's Institute is really central in biogeochemistry. So, you know, I remember Oh gosh, it was probably back in like 2017 or 2018, and I first encountered Roz Ben um, at, at the garden. He was he was presenting on crystals and some of the 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 energetic story of Philadelphia. And you know, I was never a crystal person. I felt like that felt like I don't know. It all feels kind of fringy until you realize that the stuff that yesterday you thought was fringy is actually today linked to high level theoretical physics and you know ancient. Uh, practices of um, 
not exactly like ways of living, like indigenous ways of living on the land in in the Indian subcontinent. So, and this was something that Kunz was directly in, attached to, as well as Julius Stolman, because Stolman had done a tour in uh, India and met with Nehru. Uh, with Norman Cousins in the early 1950s, right around the time that this was all happening. So India is definitely very much in the mix along with the physics. So again, all of this sort of feeds into the letter that um, Kunz was writing to Sorapkin. So, and and just so you see, this this actually was a, a, a lecture that was given in 1950. So I guess I'm just looking that the letter to Sorapkin was 49. So this was the next year. Um, the role of a biological field theory in education, um, and that's Fritz Kunz Foundation for Integrated Education at the bottom, and I, I've saved this eight page paper. It was read at uh, an American Association for the Advancement of Science um, and, and, the, and the Foundation for Integrated Education offered it. So this was a paper that was presented in a formal construct. And one of the things Kunz was talking about, let me go on the next slide, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to read this one off. So this is just these, I'm going to read two paragraphs, and these are just at the end of an eight-page paper. And I would say if you guys are out there and anybody out there who's into, who knows more about molecular physics or biogeochemistry than me, like, can you please go and look at it? <laughs> because I'm not prepared to actually fully comprehend this in more than the most broad stroke ways, but I feel like these letters are really key. So I'm just going to read off. This is the, from the, the last two paragraphs of this paper on the, the biological field theory. And again, think about that within the context of what happened with the radioisotopes, Oak Ridge National Labs, the Savannah uh, Laboratory for Ecology in South Carolina, and the use of radioactive isotopes in tracking molecular processes, energetic economies, and understanding how life quote unquote works, like how you go from having minerals or things that we may consider inanimate to something that has a consciousness. Okay, so this is that this is uh, from Fritz Kunz's letter in 1950. In principle, there is nothing novel in the suggestion. If investigation justifies the concept, it will then be time to make some revisions in our philosophy of life, and these we must expect. Okay, so you need to revisit what you think of as life. For if the problem has remained for centuries before us unsolved, we must conclude that the thinking which frames it has some defects. Changes in that thinking may require of us some considerable adjustment. So he's saying like we need to rethink how we see the world. Some of the features of that required new thinking are suggested to us by analogy from recent events in physics. It may turn out that the field and not the cell is totipotential. In that case, crystals of inorganic origin may come to be regarded as very limited expressions of the life field. In such event, all, all that is left complex space-time order are such items as rational parameters, symmetries, and the like. Everything else is necessarily suppressed because a static three-dimensional system cannot display more. The evolution of protoplasm then was a device which allows of more of the field potential to exhibit itself. It affords motion in a liquid medium, and thus the organic molecule can be in consistent conjunction with the lower orders of the field geometry displayed by inorganic substances present. And so I know it's really complicated, and I can't claim to all of it, but my, my sense is, is that it, this is, is kind of in conjunction holographic. Oh, I don't have that one. No, I don't. That one's too far down on the stack. The um, the holographic life idea, and that like there's an emergence that things are connected, and that life is a continuum, and that simply the the crystals are like not yet developed into an organic level system, and it has to do with the geometry itself. So I'm just gonna go to the next slide, which is he includes this image of in the paper, which is of the platonic solids and in, in plus a, a circle. And we see like the icosahedron and the tetrahedron, which we talked about a little bit on the discussion board about Ethereum. And I think this is the tetrahedron, so it, which is mirrored across all the different aspects and the cube. And 
like the symmetries that essentially it's almost like all of mass is part of this crystalline field structure, various levels of complexity, complexity theory, and that it's on its way towards life. And so what I think, if we look at the people who are involved with creating these xenobots, which are like the living robots that are created out of these little crumbs of material, I don't know exactly what the crumbs are, but they used you know, evolutionary algorithms, like the kind of stuff that's in the Swarm Intelligence book to come up with something that they thought replicated life in some way. And they're saying we need to revisit life. That these biogeochemists and physicists are trying to come up with a crucible to create the new form of life. And it has to do with the platonic solids and crystals and uh, uh, the uh, geometry of it. And, and Jason, like you and Lynn and I, we've talked before about like the icosahedron and the prominence of that in a lot of different spaces, both in the National Interoperability Collaborative and the guy with the quasi crystals and the icosahedron shows up a lot. So, um, and I think what they're saying is um, as things become more complex, they're, they're more actionable across time in this protoplasm. Okay, so I'm going to go to the next. So this is the last bit of this paper. It's eight pages. Um, okay, so think about the xenobots. So this kind of thinking implies a redefinition of biology as the science of the self. Crystals are then merely self-forming and self-existent. Plants are self-sustaining and self-perpetuating. Animals display self-motility and self-direction. Thus, life becomes both scientifically and philosophically the condition precedent to the appearance of self-conscious moral aesthetic man. So they're showing a level of complexity from crystals to plants to animals to people, and that people end up with a morality. So the notion, and this is going back to Kunz, the notion implies that the field, besides having as its structure a consistent geometry of great interest, may also have a carrier feature which appears in living forms as sentience. Okay, so that's the carrier wave function. And I think that relates to periodicity and cycles. As remarked above, it is obvious that sentience is the root base of values. Okay, so you can't be self-aware if you have no values. For without pleasure and pain, why should there be any occasion to choose a course? And that's cybernetics. We would be inclined to look upon the just internal proportions, which we call rational parameters, as all that is left of an aesthetic and meaningful wealth in the field. In short, the universe is indeed consistent, charged, that feels electrical, charged with value and human life has meaning. The purpose of the studies here proposed is in fact that we may bring out of the realm of belief and into the realm of knowledge, good reason, teachable truth about this intellig intelligible universe. Okay, so um, to me, what, what comes out of this discussion of the biological field theory is like complexity of evolving life that, that humans are at this more complex end and they have sentience and values. So when we understand Laura Aralaga's discussion of philanthropy and technological philanthropy, it's essentially making our values and our value judgments across a continuum that is highly charged and politicized at this point more visible in terms of the machine learning. So that if they can somehow capture the nature of the values and the sentience of, of human beings, um, that that will be material that they can use perhaps to catalyze less complex life into something that is sentient. And I think that's maybe what is coming. That's what's behind the Sophia, the Hanson Robotics, the Ben Gertzel, is to, to do that, but to do it through if, if you compelled someone with a pointed stick to, to give up their life force for a robot, people would resist, right? But if you can reframe the conversation such that it's an invitation to be an active participant in making the world a better place, people will be very more than happy to offer up their data into that story rather than like, by the way, we want to train our robots to be people, so give it up. Like, that's not a compelling story for people. And this is all about setting the narrative. And I feel like that this narrative has been being built up over time, you know, at least for 70 years, which is just fascinating to see how it, it's unfurling. So yeah, I that, know this is kind of complicated. Do you have, do you want to chime in on any of it? Oh, I was just thinking about the Mormon. Uh, I was looking at this card that I got from the Mormon transhumanists. Yeah. Uh, 
at a, you know, like their slogan was, what will you create? So I uh, thought that was interesting. Um, I, I'm trying to, I was trying to think of the name of that guy because we visited, we visited so many different places, but he was associated with Rice University and he has the company that's, that's doing the Xenobots. Uh, I was going to I was going to show people a screenshot. No, I don't think that's the Xenobots. It's a different it's a different guy. OK, see, I can't keep track of yeah. all this stuff. But no, what, what, no. Who's the guy um, that's doing the Xenobots? I, I was just going to show people a screenshot of the of the of the YouTube because there's actually a video that explains because a lot of people are like Xenobots. What is that? Uh, oh, you know what? If, I, if I, can I, find I, it. I have so much information. So I have the map. I might have sent you the map about the, the Xenobots. Like, look on the discourse. Put in Xenobots if you can have another screen. Yeah, because I know there was a I've there was a video where it. they explain it too that was actually put out by the company. You, yeah, yeah. So it's these little bits that are like crumbs that they use to develop through evolutionary algorithms, and then they quote unquote had babies, which is like by piling up more crumbs. And it just seems like something out of a terrible science fiction, right? Like we're not taken over by Godzilla, and we're taken over by like crumble bots or something, you know? The um, but. Yeah, so I'm just gonna keep going. If if you okay. can find it, I have it in the discourse. I've made a map of it, but I, I didn't pull it up right here. Okay, and you just uh, Xenobots X E N O B O T S. So if you just look it up on YouTube, there's a bunch of videos. Out yeah, there about them. Yeah, it's 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 disturbing. So they're yeah they're they're working on that. So now I'm just going back to the uh, letter, and I need to, to to yeah the the letter that Kunst wrote Sorokin. So this is the following year. Uh, wait a minute, let me just get to that point. Okay, okay, so this is this is uh, uh, Kunst to Sorokin, okay, his letter, 1949. Actually, it's the previous year, 1949. So next, with reference to metric number and symmetry, there is um, no problem if we avoid the learned nonsense of defining zero as, quote, the null class of numbers, as B. Russell, I think that's Bertrand Russell does. I would like to go into this here, but it would take too much time. So I will merely say that by this definition, we deprive ourselves of a wealth of material for how can numbers be ratios in that case? Okay. By metric, I mean internal proportions, such as rational parameters. I am interested in nature and man. So again, this gets to be like man in the biosphere, the UNESCO work that Leo has been looking into, um, man embedded in the environment, which is of course accurate. Speculative mathematics should be a means to insight, not only ends in themselves. The CGS system is useful, but artificial. But until someone equates it to nature, as Eddington hoped to do, it must remain chiefly an instrument for the study of phenomenon. Surely you are bent on noumenal insight. Eros is a deeply buried reality. So that's kind of a crazy paragraph, I'm just saying. Like, they're working on math and systemization and environment, and then it ends on Eros. Eros is a deeply buried reality. So my study makes crystals the starting point. Okay, so that's his, his biological field theory for reasons given. Man and society are my objective. Please study more closely pages nine to 13 and the geometric plate which follows. So I think that's what I showed you. Quite categorically, in answer to your question, what I was proposing is indispensable for the reason that form and function are correlation. The decisive question is this, can we expect to give better answers inside physicalism? The answer is no. Then how do we break out scientifically? There are three or four ways of which parapsychology is only one. In this, yoga, et cetera. Okay, so I'm gonna go on to the next one. Uh, is too deeply buried to be got hold of directly by everyone. So we cannot use the findings for a synthesis based on data shared. So I will mention that there were a key person who was part of the Duke Parapsychology Center was part of the Foundation for Integrated Education. So like Duke University has had a parapsychology center or it did starting in the 1930s based on the American Psychical Society that was built on the British one. So again, it's not super loopy that they're talking about parapsychology here. So he says, here my technique, should be useful, is the same as Plato in principle. But now we know how to separate uh, static archetypes from dynamic. That is what you need. Love is a function and its forms varied. 
So I just want to say that again, love is a function and its forms varied. So they're interested in love and they're interested in eros. So I think, again, thinking back to the picture of Laura Aralaga's article, they're, they're trying to, to quantify love as a mathematical function. Okay. So by starting uh, with crystals, we nail down the static archetype. And that is all that we want from them at first. But by this process, we also get at, quote, dynamic archetypes such as love, truth, and beauty in Plato's sense. Whatever elegance there may be in my procedure consists of tying polytypes to spherical harmonics and gathering in all natural forms and functions so as to get the creative nourishing orders such as Eros, which lie deep in the universe. So... You know, I'm not great at all of the archetypes and polytypes. I mean, I think that that has a lot to do with psychology and um, it's interesting in this, like the Mellon family is very integral and Paul Mellon and his wife were very interested in Jungian psychology and they actually acquired all of Jung's archives and made them available, I think, electronically or in publication. So there, there is something about sort of gestalt and psychology that, that feeds into this, into the, these archetypes and in terms of finding the order of, of the world. Okay, so back to Kunst. The major question before all of us, I believe, is whether we shall ourselves seek a consensus which extends from the solid basis of measurement science into higher ranges. If so, phenomena alone, statistics will never be enough. Um, we shall have to compromise on arbitrated opinion, and that means eventual disintegration. The alternative is to go as far as we can into the noumenon first by processes quite empirical, and then the further extension of known methods is safe. In hyperspace, we can readily set up axioms which lead to the tensors you want, but we cannot do so in space and time treated separately. So I think there, it seems to me that there's something that they're trying to get at in hyperspace in terms of experimentation or further development. And I do feel that the hyperspace meta and also the psychological aspects and the archetypal aspects, which may relate to the character avatar component that people are playing at um, in these gamified quest environments is part of it. I Again, I don't see how it all necessarily fits together, but clearly there's something that they're trying to get at that they don't yet have the equipment to get at. But if they could create hyperspace, then they would be able to take their experimentation to the next level. And I think maybe that's where we're at now. Like we've entered the hyperspace um, moment. Well, not to like, I don't know if this, this relates, but I, I, in hearing that the whole conversation about archetypes, um, I was thinking about Joseph Campbell and the work that he did and sort of defining these archetypes. Um, anyway, kind of maybe it's a side and a side, but. Um. Well, no, because so, I mean, this is I don't have this map at my, my fingertips, but, you know, I was when we get around to doing the, the presentation around the applied mathematics, Zen, Buddhist, Trappist, monk, brownie impact program <laughs> like one of the things that was part of that like i was mapping campbell and the sri aurobindo and the esalen and the self-actualization movement which did have maslow was a key participant at esalen and campbell was as well a major figure at esalen and, and campbell had go ahead no i just so get, campbell... go ahead. <laughs> Okay. All right. So Campbell is excellent too with Maslow, <laughs> who's, you know, connected with all of this. And he had spent time at Bindo's um, uh, with the mother. I can't remember her name. Mira Alfasa, I think, she was an Algerian Sephardic Jew who had married, not married, but become sort of like the, the she had taken over this ashram Sri Aurobindo after the, the passage of the main guy. And um, in that ashram, Woodrow Wilson's eldest daughter went to go live there. So her inheritance was that she would be taken care of as long as she never married. And so she went to this ashram, the Sri Aurobindo ashram, which what I understand from Deepti is now sort of the quintessential UN smart sustainable living center like uplifted as this iconic smart living 
and it, it had these very direct ties to Esalen and the Bay Area, like yogic tradition. And Campbell and Woodrow Wilson's eldest daughter were translating early Sanskrit texts there. Like that was part of one of the key projects he did early in his career. So I think the archetypal thing is built into all of this, into the gestalt psychoanalysis, um, but what layered now with a technology that is a technology that's well behind any kind of technology you'd find in an ashram, you know, like it's military technology. Yeah. And I thought, and sorry. A lot of people didn't know what you were talking about. I would just, that's why I was chiming in when you're like talking about the monk and the brownies and everything. We actually, you <laughs> mentioned that in a previous talk, but I, uh, in the future, Allison wants to do a, a, a longer talk about this. Do you want to just really, just in a sentence or two, just say what that was? And then it'll be a little teaser for, <laughs> for a future show. Yeah. I mean, essentially, it was an early social impact program in the 80s in the Bronx that was linked to this guy who. I think grew up sort of Jewish in Brooklyn and went to LA and then became a Zen Buddhist and, and got degrees in applied, like high level applied mathematics, and then came back to run like a social impact brownie baking bakery for people who were otherwise had challenges getting employed, like people who were coming out of the judicial, the prison system or something like that. So they were creating these wraparound services, um, and their first clients were like Ben and Jerry's and I think Whole Foods to buy these brownies and sort of I, I think it's this early crucible for um, impact finance. But this this guy and I can't remember the guy's name. I shouldn't have even said anything. But the the, the Zen Buddhist, like he was hooked up with an, another group of Trappist monks from Massachusetts. And so they were trying this sort of ecumenical cross-cultural religious social impact finance program again, which it all sounds good until you link it to mind control experiments and like forced evolution where your you know love um status is maybe calculated along with you know can you par carry 50 pound bags of flour around <laughs> you know? well and it's I'm, always I'm really great worried. until you it's always great <laughs> until you link it to mind control you know that's just it goes downhill <laughs> after that <laughs> i know I mean, yeah if you're the one who's yeah is being mind controlled so yeah, so that one, I have a big map of that and I can post it on the discourse. So if people want to poke around in the map until I get around to doing that presentation, that's going to be another big one. Um, but interesting, very interesting. Um, yeah, you don't, ex you never expect the Zen Buddhists and the Trappist monks to hook up with the impact finance investors. So. Okay, so let me go back to the, okay, so I think we're, we're getting close to the end. This is still Fritz Kunst's letter. Um, it is true that a man of your comprehensive learning, this is Kunst to Sorokin, can evoke responses from comparable intelligence and create leadership. If nothing more could be done, that would be admirable and timely in itself, but it must end in making a party. What we, what we want surely is to activate the scientific world as a whole, to give your new work the fullest possible authority. We do not have to wait until my project is far advanced, but I feel sure that some knowledge of the principles imp implied in this work on the morphology will make it certain that you will be in line with the eventual outcome. I only wish I could further be further along the way in with my task. It, uh, it is much to have rounded out the argument and to have beaten the technical parts into such simple visual forms as to make it understandable by inspection. At least the gains will not be lost. We are shaping up a study of cooperation, symbiotic ecology, etc., as suggested by many, including Sonat, Montague, and Hartman, and this will be the substructure to your studies. So again, they're sort of uplifting Sorokin, saying like, "Hey, we should be able to work together, and your work corresponds with our work, and you know, we're moving it along. We wish it were farther. We're trying to get it advanced." But these three figures, um, uh, Sinat, Montague, and Hartman, I had already looked into some. Um, in a bit. And then there's the next slide. This is the last of the letter. It seems a pity that we do not have the beginnings of our Institute for Integrative Studies so that we can start the collection of common data and build it up as the project as enriches it. Our good friends at Yale are appearing in number and in vigor. They may adopt us for the time being, finding space where we can house our studies and keep the creative forces linked together. I have a couple of cases of models and the like, which ought to be somewhere where they should be used to stir up thought. And so at this point, the Yale connection is really important because Henry Marginal, who is 
a high level physics professor at Yale was the chair for the Foundation for Integrated Education. And I think that is the, that co correlates to the Institute for Integrative Studies. It became the Foundation for Integrated Education. So the Yale connection, like these aren't just some goofball people, right? Like new agey folks. These are this, they know what they're talking about. They've got pe friends in high places. And then this is just a letter that was also in the archive from later in that year where they were talking with Ashley Montague, who was referenced in the letter there, that they were going to be doing experiments in the New Jersey schools. So early on in the letter, they talked about the need for these five or six groups and doing the experiments with the tensors. And, you know, it really makes me wonder, like, I would love to see what happened with that experiment. Like if there's any publication, I'm not sure how to look it up. Um, Montague was later with Rutgers University and was doing sociology there. So, um, you know, I wonder if he, I haven't yet looked because I was putting this all together this morning, if he has a paper about those experiments on, in New Jersey and were the students children or were they ad adult students? It's hard to say. So, um, so these are the folks, I pulled this out of the blog post that I have not yet published of who the folks were that were referenced. Um, in that last line of the letter, Edmund Ware Sanat, um, he later became a member of their research board for the Foundation for Integrated Education. He was a botanist and a geneticist. And so again, a lot of the work that Leo's been doing lately um, has been around um, botany and genetics and mutation. And he was a proponent of organicism and metaphysics. And I think organicism is this idea that it's, it, it's a, a different element of, of Darwinian evolution and something where you can, like an existing life form can acquire traits after birth and pass that on to their progeny. And so that feeds into the epigenetics. Um, so we had a book, Biology of Spirit, and he was a director at Yale of the Yale, Yale Sheffield Scientific School and somehow also interested in colonial architecture. So we've got uh, botany, genetics, metaphysics, and organicism. Ashley Montague, uh, he did his uh, dissertation at Columbia under Franz uh, Boas, and, and he was looking at uh, Aboriginal people of Australia. So that was really, he was a pretty controversial figure around race. Um, I'm trying to remember what the controversy was. I think maybe he said that there was no race at all. Um, and he published on race, women, and the importance of touch. So that's interesting. I know a lot of people in terms of like alternative medical treatment around touch. Um, Hartman, which I'll go into further, he was a, a longtime professor of philosophy at Ohio State and later at uh, University of Tennessee, Knoxville. He developed the science of measuring values, value-based axiometry, and it was about measuring character and goodness. And so from a small child, evidently, so the story goes, he was very interested in being good and quantifying what goodness was. And he ultimately was credited for the idea of developing the concept for profit sharing and the 401k. So I think this goes back, the impact finance space of you can demonstrate your values by what you invest in and where you put your money. And, you know, I have this memory of like it in March when we went to the Mormon Transhumanist Association Conference and like talking to Lincoln Cannon and this other guy who helped co-found it and saying, listen, you don't understand there. You're going to use financial markets like free market financial markets to create a crucible for your soul <laughs> with these impact finance metrics and the Web3 impact investing and biometric identity. Like they're literally going to create this crucible game and force you to use what whatever constitutes for money moving forward, tokens, credit, script as this crucible for defining your values and making them visible and you know and they're just staring at me they probably have no idea what i'm talking about but i'm talking about hartman and his crucible of profit sharing and then we have henry Marginow. and i had forgotten until this morning when i pulled up his bio because i when I was originally doing this work back in December, I had not yet done the looking into the Atomic Energy Commission and Oak Ridge National Labs and the Manhattan Project and the radioactive isotopes and, you know, X-ray crystallography and long range radar weapons and World War One. So when I came back and I read his bio again, it, I just found it really shocking. So he was the chair for the Foundation for Integrated Education that both Kuntz was lobbying for and Sorokin was involved in. He was also at Yale. He was a professor of nuclear physics, electronics, and spectroscopy. So I think the spectroscopy is, again, vitally important because we're talking about photonics and biophotonic communication. 
He did consulting with the Department of Energy, defense contractors, but he was also on the World Council of Churches. So this other piece that I've been looking into around the Quakers and the Unitarians and the light within and evolved consciousness and goodness and morality and sort of the Protestant Reformation and dissidents and this World Church Council of Church ecumenicalism is central. He also was involved in Eastern religion and he published on parapsychology, consulting with the Office of Naval Research and Argonne National Labs and General Electric. So, I mean, I really clearly need to spend more time looking into Henry Marganau because it's so many aspects of both faith, um, you know, yogic tradition, uh, Department of Energy, defense, and me. It's, it's just, it's really overwhelming for me to see all of this and revisit it, you know, eight months later uh, to see how it's coming together with the crystallography. So I'm going to just move on to Hartman next because I think Hartman is key. Oops, too fast. So on the left there, we see the little lines and dots, which definitely is evokes um, that shape image in the paper. It is uh, that sociogram that Moreno developed in 1933. So that is your early social media. They were doing it on pencil. <laughs> um, then we've got Robert Hartman. Uh, there is still a Hartman Institute that is talking about the theory of values. He was born in Germany. I think he had one parent who was Jewish and one was Catholic. He attended a, a school where he wore a shirt. And someone had told me that that, that probably was maybe like Opus Dei aligned. Um, and when his father, who was a, a, in World War I, came back at the end of the war, he was in school and the teacher said, you can go home, your dad's home. And he's like, no, I have to finish the end, the day here in my hair shirt <laughs> because he, he was that insistent on being good, or at least that's the story that was told in his autobiography. So that's again, the mentality. We have Sorapkin looking for the incorruptible people and tempting them with scantily clad women and luxurious foods. And then we have Hartman who's stuck in his hair shirt at school till the end of the day not rushing home to meet his father, but because he wanted to quantify goodness. He he left Germany um, under the rise of the Nazis. He became a, uh, he sold licensing in Scandinavia and Mexico for the Disney company, which is kind of crazy during the Second World War. And then eventually landed in Ohio, uh, taught at Ohio State. And again, we know about the Rockefeller's involvement in all aspects of Ohio, um, and then eventually ended up in Tennessee. So his dissertation work, at Northwestern was applying field theory to ethics. That's in the upper right corner. Um, he was a part of the American Association for Humanistic Psychology. So that's his connections to Maslow and those folks. And again, the humanism was very much secular humanism, um, like sort of rational religion. Uh, this 1957 conference, the science of value that was mentioned in the earlier letter and then evolved into the society, like it was part, you know, became the Society for Creative Altruism. In 1948, he he authored this book on profit sharing. And you, you notice that it was, it was printed in Columbus, Ohio. So that's the center for Case Western. Uh, that's where Standard Oil was incorporated. And, um, and so, you know, eventually he's credited with this idea of coming, the, being the, 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 the mind behind the idea of the 401k. And so, you know, again, we've replaced pensions with individual investment programs. You know, I think ultimately, as we move into stakeholder capitalism, a lot of that is going to be wiped out, like whatever value that had, you know, it's, it's just, it's digital money. Uh, but when we look at, at Vanguard and the Templeton funds and all of these things and how it's going to be melded with ESG finance and impact, like that's how you demonstrate your values um, and how you make them measurable is how you allocate your money. I'm curious, Allison, and I've been trying to figure out a way to, to summarize this. I had uh, someone ask me the other day, well, what is stakeholder capitalism? And I've actually read Klaus Schwab's book on stakeholder cap capitalism. And by the way, if you read that book, you will not get a sense of what sta stakeholder capitalism is. Um, you know, based on the research that, that we've been doing, um, you know, there's a lot of pieces of it. And, um, but Allison, do you have a, would you have a, a, a good way to, I know you're working on a glossary, uh, to describe what stakeholder capitalism is in a, in a, in a kind of a summed up way? Or is that too challenging? Um, <laughs> well, I would say it is, it is a shift to an alternative currency system 
that has embedded aspect weighted weighting um, of values and energy energetics into it and that it is part of a circular economy which is a circuit is cybernetic it is that is part of the energy economic system that it is an alternative currency that is balancing out in homeostasis and energetics but in the exchanges that happen within the circular economy uh, you you have a stake i think stakeholders actually referring to like the stake in the blockchain space where you're staking your values and in doing so make your, 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 your behaviors. This is not very clear. Um, let me start over again. Okay. So I think the stake in stakeholder capitalism relates to blockchain. I think the idea is to transition to an integrated financial system of alternative currencies that allow us to demonstrate information about ourselves, in our relations to one another in the environment through transactions. But those transactions will be different than what we commonly understand as money today. It is some sort of behavior related tokens. And that all of it is enacted within a decentralized cybernetic system, but with certain weights and values that guide behavior into this moral science. Um, so that's what I think that the stakeholder capitalist model is. It's, it's not about a particular political outlook. It is, it is a cybernetic outlook and it is something that is fundamentally about developing uh, interoperable, rich digital environments to train AI. And it is, it is done within a narrative construct of peace and sustainability and love and collective caring that compel people to go along with it. I don't know. Is that? Yeah, that's, that's a good start. <laughs> Thank you. I appreciate that. <laughs> and crystals. There's stuff with crystals and biogeochemistry in there somewhere. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot of pieces to it. Uh, and again, it's there kind of is. funny. If you read, like, that's why I wonder about Klaus Schwab, because, like, I've read two of his books now, and it doesn't explain like it, it first of all they're very elementary like the way that they the way it's, it's almost like a pre it's they're written for like preteen audiences or something um but like you you'll read these books and and it's so broad and generic it doesn't actually he doesn't actually talk about any of the stuff that 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 we've been going into so you you're not going to get a good sense of what stakeholder capitalism by by reading stakeholder capitalism from uh klaus schwab just saying well, isn't that the whole point of narrative warfare though, right? Yeah. It's obscure, it's obscuring. And and I would say it, it's also polarizing and it obscures the truth. And, um, but then it makes you feel like you know you're in the know because you know you have the currency of knowing that, oh, it, this guy's responsible. Like he was meant to be the lightning rod for this, right? You're not supposed to find out about the Harry, Henry Marginaus of the world or the Robert Hartman's like you're not supposed to. And I'm not saying that these people are individually some like major evildoer. I'm saying you're not supposed to understand how the structure works. Um, they, they, these individuals were part of a socio technical system towards a certain end that we're not. Most people are not aware of and have no clue that we're going there or those of us who do see where we're going, how to how to intervene in it and redirect. Um, but it takes the willingness to go the next to pull the thread and go the next step and even if you don't understand it like clearly i don't understand everything chris fritz kunz just said i really didn't understand it eight months ago but i understand it a lot better having spent a month under looking into radio ecology and looking into some of these other aspects um now i understand it better and plus we can see it coming out of the blockchain space exactly what this is going to look like in a way that we didn't before it was more white papers and we didn't actually have videos with nf trees spinning around so now we have at least something more concrete to work with um but you have to be invested in doing your own work i mean I, i'm laying out a lot of, a lot of stuff like what i do is i go and collect a bunch of stuff in my bag and i try to sift through it and put it out but i am in no way saying i have all the puzzle pieces you know i have my friend Steffers is off on a, a gallivant, you know, through some amazing material that is totally, I mean, related, but independent of this. So we all have our pieces, but like, don't wait for them to give you the quest, like just go find it. And that's what I'm, I'm hoping with our board. And, and even so, you know, I can tell 
you know, and not that it's about the data analytics. And I know that we should say like, separate yourself from the outcome, but the, 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 the items on there, and I would say at this point, like maybe, you know, eight out of 10 things up there are things I've put up there. Um, the ones that have the most counts are like the two items that are the most easily understandable, like the bench with a sensor and well, there was some a lot of stuff on the, the climate, the blockchain climate, which I was glad to see, but it was like the homeschooling one and the bench with the sensor. And I can see because those are things that people have a comfort level with. They're like, okay, I understand the sensor. I, I understand, I think I understand about getting kids out of compulsory schooling. But you need to actually like, I can't tell you what you need to do. Maybe you're, you'll find a whole other track, but what I'm saying is like stuff that isn't comfortable, like don't be afraid of it just keep going because sometimes don't let anyone tell you because you're not the expert, you can't go on that track because you can figure stuff out. And in fact, it's those of us who aren't embedded in the system, I think who can find and put the pieces together or shed light or new perspectives on things that the people who are embedded in it simply have no capacity because they're fish in water. Yeah. So, okay. Well, and, and I, like I said, I'm actually, you know, managing the, the forum and I'm, I'm just trying, I'm figuring this out as I go along. So, um, yeah. It's a process, but it requires it requires some work. And I think we're just used to, you know, listening to, oh, who do you listen to or whatever? And it's like we're not we're not used to, like, actually having to, like, do do the homework ourselves, you know. Uh, so, yeah, it's a little bit more work. And on, on the Klaus Schwab thing, I was just thinking I would have loved to hear the debates about whether or not he should have a cat that he's pet petting while he's talking to people <laughs> he's an archetype right yeah like in the same I had, I had somebody email me yesterday about Yuval Harari and I'm like he's an archetype like he's there to capture your attention and to make you afraid but to also make you like feel kind of in the know because you know about the guy that other people don't know and that you can point to and like it's all part of the back and forth of this digital media communication like we're we've got sort of the low, low budget, no budget, you know, version, like prickly, hard, like not polished version of this. Like we're the probably the polar opposite of most of the stuff that's out there. But and yet we're turning over rocks and pulling up a bunch of material that people can take in their own direction, I think, because I, I do feel like I'm not trying. I'm, you know, I'm not here to say I have all the answers, but in my gut, I feel like this is the thing. It's the, and, and Jason, you know, the financial system, it is the inter interconnection of prescribed behaviors tied to legacy religious and faith practices integrated into financial systems with sort of a free market bent embedded in these technologies and, and spackled over with this sort of saccharine do-gooderism. And, and that's what we're kind of, is the, at the core of this. Um, these are the pieces. And so like, I would love for people to find some more of these pieces, so. Yeah, and I think I'm getting better at these, uh, at my, at the pr putting the presentations together. So hopefully you guys appreciate that. Well, I don't mean low budget. I just mean you don't get any money. Not that it's yeah, not yeah, good. Yeah. Like, yeah, for sure. I'm just saying, like, you could feel free to. I, I, I know what you meant. Yeah, I know what you meant. I know what you meant. Yeah, I did not mean qual. I, I, yeah, that yeah, didn't yeah, come I know what you meant. I know what you meant. There are things that are meant to capture your attention in this weaponized narrative and, like, say, look right this way and look over here and not over there. And I think the stuff coming out of World Economic Forum, these very polished people, and the, even the top layer of the most, you know, the COVIDpreneurs, you know, all of that, like that's, um, we're not, anyway, that's, we're not that. So, okay, yeah. uh, next slide. So this is just a bit on um, uh, Hartman. Again, he landed, and I, this is something I did not understand when I first came across it in December, at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And I thought, well, that, you know, you've got this globe trotting guy. He's he's also had a, a very big footprint in Mexico and Latin America. He, he split his time. Uh, and, you know, he was at Ohio State, which is, you know, a very, you know, big university system. And then he ends up at the end of his career at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. And again, no shade on Tennessee. It's just smaller and it's kind of out of the way. And um, his papers are there um, and he, the Institute is still based around there. And you can see his his focuses were axiology, which is the scientific measurement of value, logic, peace, morality, profit sharing and ethics. So there's your combo. And I think peace, I want to spend some more time on later, but getting back to the Quakers and peace and peace being 
interchangeable for cybernetic homeostasis, that that's, that's what's coming. So, so he was in, in uh, Knoxville, and then his center for axiometry was also connected in Knoxville and this nearby um, community of Alcoa. <laughs> and so that jumped out at me. These were two people who have continued his legacy. They were, uh, David Mefford was a student of his, and they've got this access solutions, this axiological science. A lot of it is framed as sort of human resource management, um, personality profiling, um, uh, his wife is helping him on this. She has marketed these products and their, their clients have included, we'll get this, Oak Ridge National Labs and Alcoa Aluminum. Now Alcoa Aluminum, they were actually integral in the Manhattan Project in doing the containerization, the canning of the uranium product in the separation at Oak Ridge. So the very fact that the, um, now we've got the guy who's, you know, interested in applying the field theory to human behavior and ethics. And he's working with, um, you know, he situated himself right in the heart of things in Knoxville, just a stone's throw from Oak Ridge. And, you know, his, his um, descendants in his academic work have ties to Oak Ridge National Lab as their climate client base is something to be said. And then this is from his, uh, this is from Hartman's, uh, his, um, timeline they have a very extensive timeline which is super helpful and i'm just gonna i'm just gonna go over a few of these things so early on he was at ohio state later on he ended up in the 60s in tennessee um he spent his time also in mexico city at the uh, universidad nacional autonoma de mexico so he was doing this work what was he doing in mexico again we know arturo rosenbluth who was a very close um, associate of norbert wiener was a cardiologist again we've got the heart uh, doing cardiology and cybernetic research in mexico so i have to wonder if there was a connection there um, he was a research professor in philosophy at the university of mexico between 57 and 73. Um, in 1959 he developed something called the Hartman Cardenas Seminar on Formal Axiology and Humanistic Psychoanalysis. Okay, so he developed, I think Cardenas uh, um, was one of his colleagues in Mexico. They had the first technical applications of axiology and they developed this instrument called the Hartman Value Profile. So that was one of these screening tools for psychology. Um, after that, he obtained an appointment in Knoxville in 1968, but he split his time again between Mexico City and Knoxville. So, but again, the backdrop of this is Oak Ridge. And uh, at the time he was on the, the board of editors of the Journal of Transpersonal Psychology. And that included Arthur Kostler, uh, who was also connected to holography and Maslow. And then also in 68, he was chairing a panel on ethics and philosophy of values. So we have to really embed this not only in the Atomic Energy Commission in Oak Ridge, but also in the emergence of impact finance, ESG, stakeholder capitalism, impact finance, embedded in relationality around poverty of people and also sustainability and managed ecosystems. Okay, so just I'm going to move on from this slide, but just realize he has these ties to Mexico. He has the ties to psychoanalysis and screening tools for human value. And then the next piece is, whoops, I oh I missed one. Okay, so the next bit here, um, he established a company called Axiometrics Inc. in Texas. So the Texas is connection is is I think significant. We know. A lot it was happening um, at the University of in the UT uh, system, both in Austin and then in Dallas, and uh, uh, you know with the chip development. Um, so Axiometrics there, and then also in Tennessee the next year uh, in 1970, there was a memo submitted to the National Institute of Mental Health that they could use this tool that he developed as a predictor of violent behavior and useful screeners. So again, the mental health aspect, that's a huge part of the human capital finance is screening tools for recidivism and mental health. Uh, he published this value profile in Alcoa, Tennessee. Um, so the axiometric testing service was based in Alcoa and also published a research manual in Alcoa. So the next slide just shows the situation of Alcoa 
And again, um, the two circles, the one at the top is Oak Ridge National Labs. The one at the bottom is the, the town of Alcoa and to the upper right uh, with a bit of a darker um, name there, that's Knoxville. So you've got this triumvirate of Knoxville, Oak Ridge and Alcoa there again with this gentleman who wants to quantify love and goodness, tie it to profit sharing and 401ks, and then work on uh, humanistic psychology and field theory for ethics and human behavior. Um, you know, that's that's a lot. And so he wrote a book here called, uh, he's, he wrote a lot of books, The Knowledge of Good. Um, and I just pulled up a couple of uh, the table of contents, uh, and I can't actually really read it, but you you guys can read it. I know Jason had to turn down the 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 um, whatever the it makes it kind of hard to see. But essentially, okay, so levels of value language, all right. So systemic uh, values, uh, the the logic of values and the language. Uh, Moore's math meta ethics. Moore's meta ethics, the science of good. Uh, the metrics of the science of ethics. And so I'm just going to go on to the next slide, which is continued in the table of contents. Uh, okay. Oh, no. no. Okay. No. Okay. So, and this is, oh, sorry. It, it seems to be not. Okay. Uh, so, let's see, good may be subject to formal stru uh, structurization, uh, looking at um, like the axiological value of reason, the necessity of reason and moral conduct. And, and so th the irony of this, and we're, we'll get into this a bit later with the, the Andresens, is the idea that you're going to come up with some really socio-technical system of morality and ethics. But in truth, the people who are supposedly developing these systems, they're never going to apply it to themselves. They're only going to apply it to other people, the measurement of value. So, um, you know, this is it is a science It is implied sociology of science that's linked directly to financial markets. And I think has everything to do with today's stakeholder capitalism program. Now, I came across this thesis when I was looking into trying to connect axiology to money theory. And uh, this is a dissertation that was done with HEC in Paris, which is one of the top uh, um, uh, business schools in France. And it was called Creative Monetary Valorization. And Jason, like, I think you and John Titus should like dig into this paper <laughs> and unpack it a little bit uh, because this was done in 2009. And essentially, it's about sort of coming up with alternative economic structures that represent your values, both in terms of sustainability and ethics. And in his uh, dissertation or thesis, this um, thing at the top, this icon, which is at the top on the right, that was just took up one of the pages, which is an odd thing to include in your thesis dissertation, but it, it says, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, I can't get big enough to see it. Oh yeah, great. Uh, the, the perennial value creation. So that's sort of this um, circular economy, but you've got a pi, the at sign, a calligraphy R, this like, you know, it's not a uribos, it's kind of like an open-ended one, almost like a musical thing. And then you've got the, the magenta that's intersecting in with the letters, and then it sort of falls out into the valuation is almost like a dendrit, veritic tendrils with little dots which reminds me a lot of the whole uh, phosphorus energetic economy that the woman from Arise talked about with the, um, uh, you know, the, the exchange of the fungi and the root and the, the economic construct. So it's a very unusual calculation. Um, and then this person, uh, Christophe, uh, I know it's Place, Place uh, it was his uh, work. Uh, so in the decades since then, he became a professor of environmental economics in Geneva. Uh, he did that for uh, a few years, and then he became an observer of community currency in action. So these are these new alternative currency systems, again, all digital, which is part of the European Orig Your Regional Development Fund. Uh, he did that for a couple of years. That's based out of Brussels. Then he was a project leader for innovation and sustainable finance for impact. Uh, he did that for less than a year. That was in Switzerland. Uh, he was a lecturer in sustainable social currency innovation in um, 
University of Applied Sciences in Geneva, again, for seven years, and is now the founding president of the Swiss Currency Confederation. Um, and that was as of 2017. So um, I, I do have, before you say something, I, the next slide is just a list, and it's, it's going to be hard to read, but it's a list of their case studies and figures. But if you look at it, these case studies are all sort of alternative economic systems. But I, I feel pretty clear, especially based on his uh, LinkedIn, that these are cybernetic uh, blockchain currency situations. Um, you know, they're talking about bartering, cultural collective, uh, you know, reforestation alternative currencies, um, and, and all of it is about metrics and measuring and energy um, finance. So uh, let's see, I'm just gonna do one last thing and then you, and I'm gonna leave the floor to you. This is the last one. This is actually a bit of a, a, a map that I talked about in my, uh, the presentation I gave with Shai Danan on the noosphere and whose story wins. But I was looking at uh, Trent McConaughey and he was developing Ocean Protocol, which is uh, an interoperable data system, like a permission data system for impact finance data uh, that you would, the data sets would go into this and people could access it privately uh, without having to pull it to their server, but they would process it for AI machine learning and that it was creating sort of a platform for value creation through uh, the access and use of interoperable impact finance data uh, directly connected to ESG investing. And so like within a presentation he was giving, which was very much futuristic, like we're gonna put our mind into like blockchain mind files and explore Mars in alternative dimensions. And, you know, life is like a game of civilization, this online game that be things become more and more uh, complex that we can actually work on self-actualization like Maslow's self-actualization prom promises through the use of token economics and engineered tokenization and through the exchange of tokens for social justice, ecological justice projects. And so to me, that is the crucible that's linked into the transhumanist human plus mindset is that through this transacting, you're actually creating and refining the digital twin that will be your, you know, pretend Mars blockchain mind file or whatever, like you're never going to Mars, but you know what I mean? Like th this concept that as you make this twin through your cybernetic currency exchanges, all tied to value, um, the, 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 the sustainability value and the, the social justice values. So um, I think that's probably, I'm sort of done with the, that block of the Kunt, Sorokin, Hartman, field theory, finance, token element. And I don't know if it makes sense to anyone else, but to me, it, it just, it really resonates looking at that trajectory from 1949, where they're saying like, we know what life is. Life is sentience, life is values. We think if we can figure out how to track values that we will unlock some information. Uh, to do that, we need hyperspace. The hyperspace equates to the digital twinning at Purdue and the, the the tracking and tracing, which is very much related both to the you know radio radiological isotopes and these stupid tracking devices that we have through Wi-Fi. Um, that that's the, the, the tracking for the twinning and that the next phase, they really want to know what our values are. Um, and they want to exacerbate and inflame people's like strength of their values. And again, I'm not saying it's a bad thing to have a value system, but I think a lot of times social media is being used to create false drama, to activate people's emotions, to make, to inflame, to raise their dopamine endorphins, like fight, flight, responses to amplify the signals that they're getting because this is all signals intelligence. Yeah. Uh, look, new screen layout. Ooh. Ooh, look at you. <laughs> High production I, I, value. I'm, it's funny. <laughs> while, while we're doing the show, I'm still like playing around with the, the, the settings and, and changing things up. So, um, yeah. Uh, Shoot, what I, I was going to say something off of that, but then I, I lost my track. So someone had mentioned, how does Allison find all this stuff? How do you how do you get all this stuff? You know, it's funny because I was in, in I realized that money was a big deal. Probably in around 2005, I, I kind of got on to like, oh, it's the banks, the money, and I needed to study it. And I would go out and I'd buy books and I would read articles. And like overwhelmingly, most of it was not about what it's 
you know, the, the most important thing. So like doing research is actually really hard to get to, to actually find the good the good nuggets where you were like, oh, this is actually a really important piece. And, and I think you're really good at that, Allison, uh, you know, constantly putting up new stuff that's that's actually relevant and new. Um, you know, so uh, how do you do you want to say anything about your process in terms of how you end up like finding all these pieces or? <laughs> well, I mean, I think some of it is is the field maybe i think it's it's being willing to i mean you you get something and maybe you feel in your gut it's important right so i mean the, the other thing about this online space the discourse is I, there is something to collaboration like to unearthing pieces that you can share with other people and that's like really what i've been craving for a while is just like people who I'm not saying everybody has to think exactly the way I think, but are, are coming from a similar framework and willing to sort of mull over our complicated ideas. And, you know, that wasn't, you know, clearly the Facebook stuff fell apart. And then Twitter in and of itself was, it was clear that my message wasn't getting out. And I felt worried that because of how it was being structured of who was following me, they might try to like, like, again, create a digital representation of me that was inaccurate based on, pretend people following me <laughs> and the communication wasn't happening there either. So I'm, I'm, I'm really grateful that hopefully we can have a space for that, like, like a common collaboration. And that's what I, I really appreciate about like having a small group of people that we can do that with and you facilitating that through your gifts of, of, you know, these online discussions and, and the technology behind it. So, you know, a lot of it for me when I was looking at Ocean Protocol, and I don't know if I found that through you or Leo or somewhere, but understanding the importance of the impact finance data. For me, when I was doing my work that stemmed off of Heckman and Laura Aralaga and these impact um, programs, this is maybe four or five years ago, was something called Shanzai City, which I'll feature later. And when I was in Little Sis, and again, that's open source intelligence, and they were using it, I'm sure, on the back end to see what I was up to. But I would just methodically, in a very disciplined way, just look at everybody's LinkedIn. Like, I knew it was important, and I saw that they were involved in smart impact bonds on blockchain. And I knew that that was important. Again, I have a lot of people, like, t tell me, oh, you know, that video only has you know, 80 views, it can't be important. And I'm like, no, it's important because I understand the game. I understand the players. I understand the money flow. It's not going to be a popular video, but it's important. And so I was able to unpack Shanzai City and then an IXO Foundation. And then later on, I think I made the connection with when Leo was doing his work around Celo and IXO and that it plugged into Ocean Protocol. And, and then and now they've got use cases, right? They're, they're more open about the, their presentations. And so it's just gotten deeper. And so you take one thing that you realize based on how they represent themselves that it feels important and you just start peeling back. Now, the Foundation for Integrated Education, I can't remember the first piece I found for that. But as soon as I found the Sorotkin archive and I found... Um, Maybe it was the Emergent Man book because I had been following a beat on Irvin Laszlo because I know it's about the, the way of thinking. It's about like, I know systems theory it, going back to the 50s and 60s is vitally important. The, this, the, these psychological archetypes are vitally important. Field theory is vitally important. Theoretical physics. So I know like when I see something that feels like it has something to offer, I dig in. And the Foundation for Integrated Education, because Sorokin's archive is available, I was able to look at their launch parties and they listed all of the people who who were part of their committee. And literally all you have to do is go back and look just like the four people I pulled out, Sanat, Montague, um, Marganau and, and Hartman and see. And I'm you know, I'm often telling you, I, I don't necessarily always go deeper than Wikipedia because I'm just looking at the tra trajectory. Like, what are the key words? What is this guy doing? He's doing nuclear physics. Uh, Eastern meditation, uh, ecumenical religion, and uh, defense contracting in Department of Energy. Okay, that says it for me. Like, I can dig in more later, but that gives me a beat. And I'm like, well, then how does that relate to a botanist doing metaphysics? How does this relate to a guy doing profit? And the story, because some of it is your imagination. You know, and, and I have a lot of people tell me it's not connected, Allison. It's none of this is all connected. But 
I think they underestimate the importance of imagination, of, of, of crossing those, of crossing the vectors, like of finding the emergent behavior, because they're just, ugh, like, unless you can show me a whole pile of evidence, I'm not going to believe you. But the imagination is important. And I'm not trying to imagine th this to manifest it, but just to make sense of it. I'm looking to find the pattern and make sense of something that seems not sensible. Like none of this seems sensible unless you you get the lens of, oh, it's actually about tracking and tracing integrated da interoperable data of life to create, to turn anti-life into life in this misguided attempt. And yes, there's money and control and politics and stuff along the way, ideology, but at the end of the day, the, the, the thing that's that for me at this point is my understanding of what it's about. Um, so that's just how we do it as sort of discipline, serendipity, um, you know, having a nice group of colleagues who, you know, uh, are willing to listen to me <laughs> and throw things my way that they think makes intersect. And um, but yeah, I had to get out of the, the, the done of the noise of the because it felt so noisy with all the wrong things. Um, and who knows, maybe I've got all the wrong things. I'm not saying like, I'm not lifting myself up saying like, I'm, but none of those things in any way that are on, I would say 95% of social media, 98% have feel like it has much of any resonance with the things that interest me right now, which are like theoretical physics, crystallography and value theory. Yeah, well, it's study money, money and economics. Uh, I've just come to the, the thought that the, the world we live in is far more top down than people think or want to think. You know, we think of, oh, yeah, like the communists or whatever. They were command and control. But um, we don't think of our system like that because, hey, we have a choice. You know, we have we have choices. Um, but like even the choices we have are, are constructed and limited, <laughs> especially in the, in the political space. Um, but, yeah, and, and these things do connect. I mean, a lot of times I'm. And I talked to you, Allison, about this. I'm like, wait, what does this have to do with like in, it's in the same article. You'll go from like one thing to something like totally different. I'm like, whoa, 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 whoa. Like I'm like, you need a segue. You need a segue there. So you, you know, <laughs> to help me follow along, because I'm like, wait, wh what are we talking about now? Um, but if you spend some time on it, you know, I, 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 I over and over, I keep seeing that like it does connect even if I didn't actually see it to begin with. And, and like I said, maybe some of it doesn't connect, but it's all it. it it's it's all very interesting nevertheless and it's all relevant though you have if you have people that have power and resources and this is how they think and this is what they're putting their resources into it's probably worth paying attention to <laughs> you know yeah and again i'm not necessarily even saying that Sorokin or hartman knew like that Hartman in 1970, Mexico City, whatever, developing a psychological applied field theory, knew that they were going to come up with tokenized cooperatives and extract the values to make Sophia the robot more human. I, I, I don't, I mean, maybe, I mean, again, he worked for Disney, so who knows how far back the animatronics go. But, you know, um, a lot of it is, and, and, and again, I keep holding up this book, this Swarm Intelligence book, but it, it feels like when I, you know, I, if people who are watching haven't yet watched, and maybe we can link to it, are the talk we did about Musk and cybernetics and stigmergy and spintronics. And a lot of that was, was built off of work that Steffers has been doing. But the cybernetic element is so vitally important. And the emergent behavior, like you set conditions and it's like cellular automata, like you create the rules of the game and then you put things in motion. So I feel like even though people themselves may not know where it's all going, they're in a structure in which the, the rules have been socially encoded. And it's rare that someone will seek to entirely break out of those rules unless like they're truly being terribly harmed and they have the agency to get out of it. But most people play according to the rules that they're born into or that they're given. And so you don't even have to know how terrible the thing is that you're going like, you know, who knows how much Ara, Laura Aralaga knows about surveillance play tables, right? She's acting within the constraints of the social parameters that are there. And, and there is very little incentive to look beyond your comfort level because you just want to stay in your lane and get your, you know, 
your reward pellets, you know, if you're comfortable there, you, you stay in your lane and you get your reward pellets. And that's like, you know, you, you did that whole talk about disciplined minds, the Jeff Schmidt book. That's where we're at. You, you're not, I'm not saying these are bad people or that they're have, you know, outright evil intent. They're, they're archetypes in what's unfolding as a very complex centuries long legacy of domination. Right. And when you're, when you're operating within a system with certain protocols, uh, you don't really question the protocol or the system. You, you operate within it to the best of your ability in order to make sure that you're accepted socially and you're, um, you make sure that you've got an income to, you know, put a roof over your head and, and food in your mouth. So, uh, and that's understandable. Yeah. yeah. We have material needs. Like we are material beings. So, and I'm a material sure. girl. <laughs> <laughs> I, there was a movie, there was like a, I try, I'm trying to remember, there was like a horror movie where they had a scene where like, it, it was like a horror movie that takes place at Disneyland and, and like they get stuck on like the, it's a small world ride, you know, like the animatronic. It's a small world. After all. It's like, that's our future. We're going to be stuck in the, it's a horrible. small world animatronics. I know. Use your pathway. Welcome to your pathway. To the Welcome new world to your order. world. <laughs> but that's uh, so the thing. Like, it's like, even if you think about the encoding, like I, I, you know, I got to dig more into the Quakers and all this stuff, but like peaceful, what world, like, and again, I don't want people to fight. I don't want war. I don't, I don't want people to think they're better than other people, but the, 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 the plan that's being lit, spilled, like rolled out here is not what we think. Yeah. And it comes. So are people you. still holding in there? Or how are you, how are you doing? Yeah, we're, we're, we're still, get, we're still getting, we're still getting some comments here. Uh, Jennifer earlier, I don't know if Jennifer is still with us, but she asked, where can we look up social impact? And I'll just, I'm sure everybody already knows, but just in case, and I want to hit my little button here and put this on the screen, but Allison's <laughs> blog yeah. is, is wrenchinthegears.com and you can search social impact and she's been writing about this yeah. or pay for success. She's been writing about this for, you know, seven, at least seven years now. So uh, there's a lot of content on there. Yeah. Yeah. You can see my, my level, my development, my own personal trajectory. <laughs> Your, your slideshow, I know you had, I know you had some videos. Uh, you had the thing about Laura and the, and the housing thing. I mean, I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah. Did you take that out or what, or we just haven't gotten oh, to it yet? I haven't gotten to it yet. That's why I'm saying, are you, you still up for going or should we like revisit I, this? Like, I'm, I'm fine to keep going. I mean, okay. I don't, I don't know right. anybody else is feeling. How are you guys feeling <laughs> <laughs> on the, on the, give us a thumbs up. You guys want to I don't know rocking? if I lost people in like. The, Biogeochemistry. <laughs> it's, well, you know, the nice thing is they can always come back and watch it later. Uh, but I'm, okay. I'm, I'm totally down with, uh, with continuing. All right, well, we'll keep going. On. So you want me to pull up the slide? Yeah, so, there we go. All right, the cybernetic crucible of the 401k. Um, okay, so yeah, so this is the next thing that we're, we're doing. So this is, uh, it just so happened that after we decided to deconstruct this article, right around the same time, uh, this... Uh, a rather unfortunate incident came up that uh, the, the town of Atherton, California, which I guess is in the Bay Area, is like the most expensive real estate, I guess, in California. Um, they and I'm not sure if it's a California law, but every certain number of years, the community, every town has to revisit its affordable housing plan and talk about like how they're meeting affordable housing needs. Um, and which is a huge issue in the Bay Area. And at the time, there was this pushback um, among all of the rich people that they did not want uh, a multifamily housing in their community because it would lower their property values. Um, so among them, uh, uh, Laura Aralaga Andresen and Mark Andresen. Now, and I wasn't sure because initially when I saw it, it was just on a Reddit um, page, but in the past week, it's been all over the regular mainstream media. So I, I'm presuming that they, that got fact checked and that 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 is fact. Uh, accurate. So um, just moving on to the next slide. So this is this is an article from Fortune magazine about it. So yeah, Silicon Valley royalty that populates America's richest town is fighting tooth and nail to keep 58 new housing units from being built. So that's that part. And then just for context, again, I've mentioned that um, this is not the same community, but in the greater Bay Area, Santa Clara County was part of Project Home, which was the first pay for success project 
uh, in the state of California, and it was a, a, a social impact bond for unhoused people. So I don't know that, I don't think that Stanford or Laura Aralag Andresen were directly connected. Uh, it was third sector capital partners and uh, UCSF um, and Palantir provided technical assistance on that project. But in the mix against the backdrop, you know, California is an innovator in the pay for success finance space around housing. And, you know, it's an interesting contrast to them fighting a multifamily. This is not even, you know, affordable housing necessarily. This is just simply multifamily housing in that community. Real quick, so, too, I want to yeah. chime in. Uh, just a, a, a side note, you know, a lot Santa Clara County keeps coming up over and over again. And a lot of people don't, you know, maybe don't know that like the whole corporate personhood came into being in Santa Clara County. It was Santa Clara versus Southern Pacific Ra uh, Railroad. And I think that's really relevant. And we're going to be doing more work on Sa Santa, uh, Santa Clara. And I know we're going to be going out there in October, um, but also the missions, the early missions there. Uh, so th I, I think there's something really relevant about, you know, that seems to be about Santa Clara, uh, in terms of, uh, shifting us. Cause I would, I would put that into the, the transformation, you know, that's going on has, it's been going on for a long time and corporate personhood was a major piece of it because that's, that's synthetic life, right? It's, it's, it's mm -hmm. giving yeah. a, a legal fiction, uh, life. So it's, you're creating synthetic life. So that was like, that's the metaverse. <laughs> right. Yeah. And then, um, I mean, just building on that, eventually, I think the movement will be towards these decentralized autonomous organizations, which will be companies built on code with no human involvement after the coding is done. So the corporate personhood really does become machinified. Um, so I'm just going to pull it, it. This this is from that article, Fortune magazine. It mentions that Atherton has the most expensive zip code in the United States for the last five years. Um, you know, the richest places index. So this is uh, apparently uh, a, a, a quote uh, from from a, a public comment that uh, the Andresons made about the, the proposed zoning overlay. Uh, I am writing this letter to communicate our immense, all caps, objection to the creation of multifamily over zone, overlay zones in Atherton, wrote Andresen and his wife, Laura Aralaga Andresen, in an email. Please, all caps, immediately, all caps, remove all multifamily overlay zoning projects from the housing element, which will be submitted to the state in July. They will massively, all caps, decrease our home values, the quality of life of ourselves and our neighbors, and immensely increase the noise pollution. So, you know, it's a bit tone deaf that the woman who is developing philanthropy 2.0, <laughs> I mean, it's not a super well articulated comment. Actually, it's not a very sophisticated language there. And the multiple all caps and about reducing their family, their, their uh, property values because they own like four additional properties nearby plus their large home. And when I, I looked at the address on Google satellite view and these are large estates, like large private estates. So, um, you know, they're not even talking about adding, you know, wraparound service housing in this area. It's simply multifamily. And and that's the reaction we get. So when, when I used the slide earlier of Sorapkin's, um, you know, faux altruism, I would say that's, we're talking that's faux altruism is someone who's, who's made their identity around uh, the importance of efficacy in philanthropy, technology and philanthropy. And yet you're not even willing to have um, a, a multifamily units in your whole town. <laughs> it's kind of crazy. So, uh, this, I love so the, this next one. I love all the uh, the caps on that last one. The, the, the... I, it looks kind of middle school, honestly. <laughs> like it's, it look, it's, it, I mean, maybe they don't understand that this is not social media, that this was actually, I think it was a comment like submitted to the corporate zoning, board, you know, the, the town zoning board. So, so against this backdrop, I was looking around for some additional information. Now this was a, a, a it was a blog post and it included tweets from 2014, but it was a, this person, Tim McCormick, and he was talking about visiting the largest homeless camp in the U.S., which was called Coyote Creek uh, in the center of Silicon Valley near downtown San Jose. And so he was talking about the, 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 the issue of this permanent problem of people who don't have access to housing and how this is presenting in Silicon Valley. Um, in addition, he was uh, had retweeted or was in correspondence with a person, Cameron Sinclair, who is developing solar redeployable two bedroom refugee homes um, that can be de 
put up by unskilled people in two days, and they're talking about it for Syrian refugees. Now, I just want to emphasize that I just the the, the extensive series I just finished about Mondragon cooperatives also featured refugee housing and the tiny house movement, and so. I think these two are very much connected, even though this was already going on in 2014. So this this, this person who is, I, I'm assuming, a housing advocate in California is reaching out to, and I think it was even an all like a you know a, a competition or an artist project, um, this redeployable refugee housing, and saying like, hey, maybe this houselet. I think that's what they were calling them. How like could you could we use this as a houselet in this Coyote Creek camp? Maybe you could redeploy it where we are. So I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, and so so then in the, the, the follow up, and this is part of a blog post that has sort of just like multiple tweets um, that are copied. But the guy's like, oh, yeah, sure. You know, I have this one set up in in um, in Italy. I don't think it was part of an art project, but we could totally bring it to, you know, this startup house, low, low cost startup houses, you know, bring it over to the Silicon Valley. And then someone was chiming in um, about like that they were seeking uh, money from uh, finance and, you know, funders to help expand th this houselet project, this tiny home project um, again, and it's solar. So it would be sold as sustainable and, you know, small footprint. And, and so they started tagging Mark Andreessen on this, like, Hey, like you should you get Mark Andreessen's support for this project. This is incredible. And like, you know, small start socially, you know, minded, um, you know, housing programs, you know, and we need these angel investors and, and that's sort of the whole context. And then um, I'm just going on to the next slide. Uh, Laura Aralaga uh, Andresen has her own foundation. Her foundation is all about teaching people how to be good philanthropists. And, and one of those things is having a social change goal. And so, you know, it's all about quantifying and training people how to do philanthropy correctly you know, this from the person who's worried about m the massive impact of multifamily housing on her property value. And in that, uh, she was talking about different staff members and giving examples of their goals for social impact, uh, including someone named Marley Carlisle, who had formerly been a program associate. And her social change goal was around uh, wraparound services for housing, right? And so Marley, like under the, the umbrella of the Laurel, uh, sorry, Laura Aralaga Andresen Foundation, uh, you know, training program has de developed this, and I'll just read it out loud in case that people are just listening and not watching the slides, but the philanthropic purpose is to ensure people from all socioeconomic backgrounds have equal opportunity and access to housing. The social change goal is to empower and lift up the voices of unhoused individuals in the Bay Area through housing first inspired advocacy and policy change. And there are three bullet points, desired outcome. Everyone and anyone who seeks shelter in Redwood City can acquire it without unreasonable burdens. The target population is chronically unhoused individuals in the Bay Area, specifically Redwood City. And the third is support the creation and implementation of housing first policies and regulations in the Bay Area by promoting research and engaging in local advocacy and community organizing. So, um, you know, I'll just say, you know, like, Jason, do you have some thoughts here? Because, like, I know that you've been, like, working on the, the issues of housing insecurity, like, in, among others. And to me, it's just, it's sort of along the lines of what were they thinking, unless this is part of the problem reaction solution, and I can't quite see, like, are they supposed to be the sacrificial lambs for a new paradigm? I haven't quite puzzled that all out. Um, but the, the, the fact that the, the woman who has essentially been set up to train the world in how Silicon Valley does philanthropy right using the highest cutting edge technologies comes up with just such a tone deaf comment about affordable, like not even affordable, just multifamily housing in her own town. Um, it it just it just makes the whole thing a farce. When it shows how two faced, you know, how two faced they are, you know, it's it's such a contradiction. Um, can you hear me? Yeah. 
Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. On the housing thing, it's interesting because, like, you know, I've I've done a lot of work with Sherry Honkala and the Poor People's Economic Human Rights Campaign, and you know, I've interviewed a lot of poor and homeless folks uh, over the years, and the the one thing that I always hear with you know their problem with even the shelters or a lot of the spaces is it's not like they're just they're not just giving you housing they're giving you housing, but they want to basically micromanage your life. You know, they want to, you, you've got all these rules and you're, I mean, so, some of them are obviously reasonable. They want, don't want people like getting, getting out of control, but there are ulterior motives behind a lot of these things, especially when you put financial interests in, 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 in the mix. Um, but I think about even like the Disney, um, Epcot, uh, which was the, um, experimental, I can't remember what Epcot stands for, but not the theme park, but he had, he wanted to, there's a great video on a defunct land. It's a YouTube channel where uh, they were talking about, it's a look up defunct land Epcot and uh, Disney, but Walt Disney, you know, wanted to, to create these, these, these planned communities, but you had no control over your life. Like he basically was managing what you can and can't do. And this is a similar thing is just without the luxuries, you know, without the, you know, it, it's a similar thing. You, you, you're, you're, you're having to submit yourself to this. It's not just a matter of giving you housing. Uh, there's a lot more in, in, in t involved with that. And then you get into like all the smart devices and things that the tracking. And, and I, I think you have a video coming up uh, where they're talking about Palantir and the, and the tracking yeah. of homeless people. So yeah, it's, it's not, it's not what it appears on the surface. And there, and the sad thing is there's so many well-intentioned people that will get behind it and support it you know, not having a, you know, not stepping back and saying, oh, wait a minute, maybe there are some problems here because it's, there's an idea that, well, something is better than nothing. You know, yeah. it's this incrementalism, you know, well, you know, it, it, they don't have anything, so it's okay, you know, uh, to, to do that, you know, because, you know, it's better than the alternative, uh, the, the better, the, the better than what they have. So I don't know. There's that mindset well, as and well. That's I mean, and part of what I was trying to convey in, in the piece that I wrote up about the refugee housing and like connecting it to unhoused people here in the US is that like that's not a desirable long term option for people, right? A like you can't have a really functioning society, social react in, in a tiny house. And and you and we have like the city of Philadelphia has so many shell houses, like two, two story, very compact, sustainable homes, like in North Philadelphia, empty. I mean, some of them are held by the housing authority and let rot. Some of them are held by delinquent landlords and let rot. And they're just out there. And like, if you really wanted to, like, they're, they're not, um, you know, suburban big homes, but they're functional homes like these are modest well they're not a tiny house they're actually a functioning house we could renovate all of those i know that sherry i mean has been pushing for that and my my friend who has passed jennifer bennich like it's not that we don't have the housing stock we don't need to go build a bunch of tiny houses we should just fix and it's historic like it's it's the culture of philadelphia the historic row house fix what we've got employ people to fix that but that's not what the market wants the market wants shit disposable sensor-based crapola so that they can get the data to train their ai and and that's where we've got to sort of figure out what the ultimate game plan is because it's not about being humane to people it's not humane to tell a family that by the way you should be so excited now you're not in a tent you're in a house that we threw up in two days, like with some solar panels and no windows. That's not a viable solution. And like, I get why some people feel like it's maybe a better interim solution, but we need to get at the root of the problem because the, the level of dispossession is not decreasing. It's increasing hugely. And my, my concern is that we'll get to a point that like on the progressive side, they'll say, oh, well, look, we put murals on the tiny houses and they're pretty. Um, and, you know, and we've got some raised bed gardens so people can pick some kale or something and they'll call it a day and they'll just say that that's a reasonable way of living to let other people live, let other people's kids live. And and then because often those are going to be contracted for services, wraparound services with places like Geo Group, because the, the, the for profit prison systems are morphing into social welfare and those are working hand in hand with a lot of faith groups. 
So you'll have the progressive say, oh, well, it's not so bad because look, we, we, we have some hip artist murals on there and like we can throw some cooperative tokens their way every once in a while. And then, you know, maybe the faith communities and the for-profit prison companies are like, great, we can run this shit. And like, then everyone will just walk away and say, oh, let's see it today, you know? And, and it's not, like we're not actually talking about the structure, which is building a, a hyperspace world that's a military empire. Yeah. Also to giving people some autonomy and, and, you know, there's something about where people, if they don't have any control over their lives or if they don't feel any, like, I'm not going to use the word ownership, but they, they don't feel like it's, it's like, they're just a subject. They don't take, you know, they're not going to take the initiative if it's just like they're being dictated to. Uh, whereas like, uh, in 2010, we visited a, a homeless encampment in, um, in Nashville, it was very sad because there, there was some flooding and it, and it flooded out their encampment. So we actually went with, with the people and I, I interviewed them that had just lost their encampment. But they were explaining to me they had built this community and they, and they just lived in tents and everything. And they were actually pretty and they had they were self-organized and they were pretty they were fairly content. I mean, obviously, they would they would rather not live in tents or whatever. But there's something beyond just like the, the, the structure itself that they needed to have, which is some kind of control over their own lives. And they had a real genuine community. And where they would, you know, have they had council meetings and they would they would like look, they would have each other's backs. And there's a lot of complications with that too, you know, crime and, you know, watching out for outsiders coming in and, you know, maybe some sketchy people. Uh, but they'd figured out like on their own, they'd kind of self-organized and, 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 you know, basically built a little community on their own to, to deal with that. And I'm sure it wasn't perfect, but, you know, these, these, uh, like nonprofit types and stuff will like wag their finger and look down on them and treat them like treat people like their children and that, that can't do anything for themselves. And, and they, they need, they need the, the, the father figure or whatever to, to do it for them. And I, I think that mentality is, is, is problematic. There's, there's more people desire more than just housing and food. Yes, they need housing and food, but, and they don't just want to be a subject to yeah. to this you know what i mean anyway Definitely. Definitely. okay so let me go on so oh just just to reiterate so laura aralaga she uh created she's the co-founder and advisory board chair of the stanford center on philanthropy and civil society so civil society is a big piece of this getting the civil society everybody on board to say this is good and democratic and empowering and um so she was in um an MBA student at Stanford Graduate School, and she she created the first course on strategic philanthropy um, and the, their first course on philanthropy and social innovation. So she's the teacher of how you do social impact finance, at least at Stanford. Uh, and she also has connections to the Stan Stanford Graduate School of Education and is very much surprise, surprise about educational technology as well. So when she was involved uh, getting her MBA, she pitched the quote unquote local community foundation, which is ironic because that's the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, which is the largest community foundation in the country with this idea of creating a new model of impact investing. And so the SV2, the Silicon Valley Social Venture Fund, they advertise themselves as like 200 individuals and families learning how to do philanthropy right. So I'm not sure exactly who the 200 are, but it's a very, you know, select group, I'm sure, and like working on that space. So I would say, and maybe I'll include a link to this later, but I did a whole blog post back in the day or on the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, as well as on donor advised funds, which are really sneaky because donor advised funds give people the tax write off as soon as they put their money into them. but unlike other uh, foundations, they don't have to spend out a certain amount every year to keep their tax status. So these donor advised funds are held in community foundations and people can use them to sort of stash and hide their money for tax purposes. Um, and then it all sort of gets mushed together in these overall community foundations so that it kind of obscures when it comes back out the other side to fund projects, who is funding what. And so that's a really important thing is to understand the, the donor advised funds and how those work with the community foundations. And I have a blog post about that. Um, so the Silicon Valley Community Foundation is the largest um, 
foundation it, that her social venture capital fund was incubated within it. Um, at the time that I was studying it, it sort of imploded because the the, the person who had overseen um, its it was the consolidation of two different philanthropies and oh my gosh i'm forgetting the guy's name i should remember and i real forgot. quick miss um, allison <laughs> miss yeah. allison miss allison <laughs> um i need to take a break real quick because i gotta grab uh i gotta run to the restroom and i'm gonna grab some more water but just carry on but i will be back in, all right in i have control of the, of the <laughs> yeah yeah you're, you're all you're all good all right i'll be right back <laughs> Oh, Emmett Carson, Emmett Carson. Okay, so someone under Emmett Carson, it wasn't actually himself. I guess he looked the other way while it was happening, but there was a very toxic culture so, uh, within the, 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 the foundation itself and that he didn't intervene. And so he got the boot. And it's, it's really interesting because he came actually out of the Twin Cities and his wife was very involved in the impact space and also in Catholic Relief Services and the My Brother's Keeper work, I think, for the Ford Foundation. She had ties to Philadelphia. Um, so this is the incubating structure for um, SV2. And it goes back to 2008. So it started in, in the late 1990s and then came into its own in 2008. And then the other piece that's important to know is that um, the, uh, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation not only is the largest, a huge amount of its assets are in crypto. So we know like how volatile those assets are, but a huge amount, um, there, there are many people from Facebook, Jack Dorsey, ha who have large individual donor advised funds that are held within the, the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. So they have, incredible power and because of the nature of how it's structured um it's not really always obvious where the money's coming from when it comes out for these various programs both locally in california as well as internationally so okay and all right so now i guess i'm gonna start start these are some quotes from the paper itself so you know if we're going back to let me see it so where i'm on 48 let me just oh I, i'm not going to be able to do it um on this but so if we remember back to the heart paper about disruption and technology and social impact finance this is from that 2015 paper that was written by laura aralaga pitching technology and philanthropy so these are going to be quotes and i'll read them out loud so if people are listening who are looking at the slides they'll know so the first one starts off a new generation of Digital savvy nonprofits, and I bolded that, is enabling donors not only to go online to donate a few dollars, and I bolded that, anywhere, anytime, but also to receive direct feedback, and I bolded that, including photographs, video, data, or messages from the recipients, and I bolded that, on how their gift is helping transform lives or solve social problems. And so some of this is what we, you know, this is going back to the deconstructing the information warfare narrative is how do they frame it right so so laura arlaga in 2015 is looking to frame technology driven philanthropy as something that is something everyday people do all the time they just pitch in it's crowdfunding like the whole base of the, the crowdfunding mentality the gofundme um these payments is to to create the the sense that people are empowered by giving small amounts of money and which is not to say that you're not actually improving the quality of living for people in need when you give to these campaigns. But like, it's not, none of that is gonna solve the structural problems that created most of the problems in the first place. And they wanna make it seem touchy feely, like you can give a little money and you can get validated by giving personal, getting personal feedback from the people that you've gotten donations from, which I don't know if it totally qualifies as altruism because Sorotkin would say like the ultimate altruism is that you give with no expectation of receiving anything back. And this counter, this counters all of that because there is an expectation of I do this and then you do that for me. And the you do that means that I get some sort of quality data back for my gift. So when I was reading that, the first thing that I um, came to mind, actually, because I, you know, my early work in this space was in education, was that, you know, my child was in the Philadelphia public schools, chronically underfunded, um, you know, even the most basic things they did not have. I think each student was allocated maybe $10 for the entire year for school supplies from the district. That includes like co color copies, you know, um, 
anything you might need in the books, class novels, anything. There was hardly any money. And so the teachers were always having to create uh, donors choose posts. And I'm, I can't remember if Gates was behind donors choose, but the idea was like, you create like a GoFundMe for a classroom project and then parents, uh, you know, chime in for that. And so, you know, and I, I donated to some of those, but like in the end, I felt like it wasn't actually fixing any of the problems. And so um, this is a complimentary image that I found from the donors choose. And actually later in the uh, document, Laura Aralaga or Andresen specifically references this as a good example. And they're talking about developing a quality thank you package and what it would take. And this is this is from Alice Pen Pencaval, uh, the gratitude operations team, right? <laughs> like the gratitude operations team. Um, and so what there she's saying is like reflect with your students on the thank you notes. And it, she opens by saying for students, the donors choose dot org process might seem abstract. How did these materials appear in their classroom? And who are these supporters who are somehow responsible for providing what they needed? And, and I think that's so telling because again, funding a donors choose project isn't going to solve the problem of disinvestment in education. And the students know that, like the students expect that if you go to school that you're going to have the stuff you need there to learn, like maybe not extravagant, but at least basic things like books or Kleenex or some crayons, you know, if you're in kindergarten or something that that's going to be there, that's going to be part of the package. And that they, I think children should have an expectation of care, like that they would be cared for for that. Not that you're like, have to go begging in some Dickensian way to get that. So, um, I yeah, I'm kind of surprised Jason, about you like, you know, my nephews and nieces and cousins, you know, seeing this, the, the changes. Jason, that have I'm just going to pause for a second. I, I have to get a drink of water. So can oh, yeah, you talk sure. to the slide for me and I'll be for right back. For sure. Um, yeah, I, I just noticed like the changes that have happened with schooling, you know, just since I was a kid in terms of how much the parents, how much more the parents are expected to pay for things in the, in the school. And, and, and of course, you know, we always had like little fundraisers that we would do uh, where you know, for different, but usually it was for extracurricular side projects, not the core of your education. But like, yeah, the, the stuff that, that parents and families are, are being expected to pay for is, is kind of kind of wild to me. I've noticed that. Um, if, if those, uh, thanks you guys for, for sticking with us. And if you do, I, I'm, I've been kind of trying to follow up, follow all the, the, the chat. As we're going along here, I didn't mention this earlier, but hopefully everybody knows, uh, feel free to ask if you have questions or whatever, I'll try to catch them and ask them uh, when we can. Um, just, uh, just put the word question at the beginning and then I will, um, I'll, I'll grab it and then you know, maybe we'll have a little Q&A uh, toward the end of this. But, and, and again, we'd love to hear, like my, my little complaint earlier was really just, it wasn't about that I, I'm opposed to any of the other conversations. It's just, I, we're really interested in hearing what your thoughts are about some of this stuff and getting, uh, getting more feedback. So I definitely would like to hear what people think about uh, some of these things. Um, so yeah, the, uh, the Aralaga thing is pretty wild to me. The, um, that, that incident with her and the not wanting, <laughs> not wanting the, uh, multifamily housing in her community was just, it was, it's very telling. I actually had created, there was a, there was a, was it on Reddit or? Yeah, there was a Reddit page for Berkeley here. Uh, I can show you merge. Uh, this was a, uh, where someone had posted that, that thing, uh, you know, dear mayor, keep out, keep the pores out. But in the comment, in the comment section on this thing is pretty hilarious. There's some, there's some pretty, I can't actually read the comments because it's too, uh, too small, but there were some pretty funny comments. So people were, <laughs> people, once they see it, they can see through it and say, oh yeah, you people are full of shit. <laughs> uh, so that's actually kind of promising. All right. Allison's back. I'm back. I'm back. Yeah. Well, and the funny thing is like the first time I saw it was on Reddit. So I wasn't sure, like, I didn't want to share it out of term. Like if it didn't, if someone had like made up thing, but evidently like it was being covered in a lot of major news outlets. So I guess it's, which again, in the information warfare space, I don't think those gaffes happen accidentally. So I'm going to have to think hard about why exactly that, that might have leaked in that way. But um, yeah, it's, it's definitely bad form. So let me just go on to the next slide. Oh, goodness, I 
Okay, so I, you know, I'm working through these uh, quotes that I pulled from her paper, but for committed givers, technology can enable greater impact. That's impact. Whether participating in problem solving or getting real time feedback, and I bolded that, on the impact of a program, everyone now has levels of access once available only to major donors and large scale organizations. Technology now reaches people who might never have thought of themselves as philanthropists engaging a new generation of change makers. So, um, and then like the next slide, Jason, I don't know, how do, you, how do you wanna do this? Like, do you have thoughts on this? I have a couple of supporting slides and then maybe we can t talk about it. Like, cause I'm curious, like your take. So when I read this, like what I thought was real-time feedback. So we know that real-time feedback doesn't necessarily mean that Mrs. Jones's math class is sending you thank you notes. Real-time feedback is gonna be an internet of things sensor data. Like our Laura Aralaga knows that in 2015, but she's telling a story, right? And then the other one that is about having level of access to data and that people who never thought of themselves as philanthropists can be change makers. And those I think are the key points that stood out for me. And I think like even in the GoFundMe space or these small scale crowdfunding sources, like it becomes so desperate, like the need is so great. You know, when I was on social media and I was seeing more of these, like we can't crowdfund our way to someone's permanent housing. Like we can't, like you can help someone, like you can do a bit, but it's not a permanent solution. Like it's not a permanent social solution that individuals have the capacity, at least you know, in the US, maybe in the U to, to solve the problem because the problem is structural. So I think they want people to perceive of themselves as being able to make the difference through these small interventions, while meanwhile, like the larger puppet masters are orchestrating the things at the top. It's democratic, Allison. You got a problem with democracy? Uh, well, I think about like the stock market. Like, I don't think Wall Street should exist, period, end of story. I think it's a predatory, sick system that actually does not make the world better in any way, shape, or form and actually makes it very, very much worse. But it's really brilliant to let just like the little people buy little pieces of the stock and, you know, because then they get, they get vested in, in, they're invested and they're vested in the system. Mm -hmm. And this is kind of the same thing. They're wanting to you, you to vest and invest in in your small little tiny way with your little token in the system and then you're going to be less likely to question it or or you know oppose it god forbid um so i i mean i think it's quite brilliant but that's the whole stakeholder capitalism we're like everybody's going to have a little tiny piece of it but no one's going to none of them are going to have any really really any real power um you know uh yeah, that's what I think about yeah. that. And again, it's total surveillance. You know, pe you know, people don't don't think about that piece of it. They don't say that. They don't say like we're we're going to be tracking and tracing and monitoring everything you do and and then judging you based on it. <laughs> yeah. Exactly. Well, and I mentioned before about Shanzai City. Like when people ask, well, how do you find these things? And now I think like the whole trajectory. Like I found Shanzai City through IXO Foundation. And I found IXO Foundation by watching a four hour video put out by New America and the World Bank on blockchain. <laughs> and tucked in the middle was Sean Conway, who was with IXO Foundation and Amply and doing putting South African preschoolers on blockchain so they could build social capital. And I was shocked. And then I just peeled it back from there. So I would really encourage people if you haven't spent time to look into this organization. Again, on the surface, it will look like not much. Um, and, but I would say based on the networks of association that they have with the smart impact bond space and the way these smart impact bonds are, are rolling out globally, um, like in Australia, I think they're working on smart impact bonds and Korea, that these blockchain bonds with real-time sensor data are going to be coming and we need to understand how it's structured. So Shanzai City is in Hong Kong, but they do work in mainland China. And so this is actually, um, uh, let me let me see. I might need to see the whole thing to read that, Jason. Um, so Tatlam is, I think, the head of it. Uh, these are from two different uh, documents. On the one side, they're talking about early childhood education, which should sound really familiar. That's really something we see a lot of in um, in the Bay Area, both the Strong Start and um, 
I can't remember the name of the literacy one, but two of those uh, pay for success finance in Santa Clara uh, were, were targeting early childhood. Um, and so they're talking about using blockchain technology and decentralized identification and smart contracts to provide quality education resources for children in rural areas. And this is coming through something called the uh, CDRF, which was like the Chinese Development Rural Foundation that's targeting rural children in China. Um, and they had the one one nutrition package and they were talking about collecting data through smartphone applications. So parents who go out to work can view the child's development through cloud computing. So I just wanna say that again. So the one one nutrition package has collected data through smartphone applications. So parents who go out to work, meaning these are parents who are in remote rural China who have to leave their children with their grandparents to go many times very far away to cities to do work in factories, often on tech related projects or like smart those smartphone you know, companies. So they have to leave their children for months at a time and they're able to track their child's development through the cloud computing interface system that is tied to their nutrition, which is just like when like when they talk about real time data, they're not talking about the thank you letters. They're talking about this, these dashboards of nutrition and and test score data and that this this CDRF organization was working directly with Jim Heckman, who is sort of the mastermind of this at the University of Chicago um, in, in setting up social impact finance and also social emotional learning uh, metrics around social emotional learning. So again, I just want to reemphasize when we're looking at these structural systems, we can't really say that China is doing things to us. Like it's both directions. Our hands are very much in what's happening in rural China and, and imposing uh, data collection schemes on like rural Chinese families. And we have to like get a handle on that. So that's what it means. Like they want to come up with these cutesy ideas about real time data collection and feedback. But in reality, this is like BlackRock's Aladdin computer sorting through the nutrition data on children in rural China. So in the next slide. OK, so this quote, it says, um, historical, cultural, emotional, behavioral, regulatory and organizational barriers rather than technological ones are often what stand in the way of progress. Change can be unsettling, particularly in a se sector like philanthropy, where accountability is almost entirely self-imposed. And so this is how Laura is structuring her story like so she's the she's the expert on how to do philanthropy right on philanthropy 2.0 at stanford and she's going to come in and say well you know we have the technology to do it right but people are stubborn and they're just not coming along they're just not agreeing with us on how we want to do it and 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 she's kind of shaming people sort of implying that well in the past maybe they did their philanthropy from an emotional like m like not logic not data but on emotion or what they felt was right and maybe they made some bad mistakes but you know they they don't want to be accountable because in the past they didn't have to be accountable to anyone and but now we're saying that they need to be accountable and it needs to be transparent through the data so she's the change agent and what she's setting up is saying we need to do the social change agent work that will get everyone on board to do the next thing which is data-driven philanthropy so okay so can i play this jason or this is a short clip. yeah yeah go for it okay are you able to click it oh here i can I click it on click my end it. there we go Hopefully, are we getting audio? I don't hear anything. Okay, hold on, let me pause it. Let me just check here, boom. I just gotta check a couple settings. Oh, the virtual cable, oh, there we go. I gotta turn the audio on. I had the audio on, sorry guys. Okay, let's try this again. Go back to the beginning. Every year in the United States alone, individuals and families give away almost $300 billion to charity. There are so many worthy causes to give to every day. Schools, communities in need, climate change. But at the end of the day, 
Are you really making the biggest difference you could be making on the issues you care about the most? At the Stanford Effective Philanthropy Learning Initiative, our mission is to help donors become more effective, strategic philanthropists. We conduct research to understand the realities of philanthropy, identify the challenges, and uncover new approaches and solutions. We develop tools, guides, workbooks, and data-driven resources to get key insights and best practices into the hands of those who can use them to make a difference. We lead workshops and courses to educate donors, their families, and their advisors on how to elevate their philanthropic practice. Whether you are new to philanthropy or more experienced, whether you are a donor, a trusted advisor, or a philanthropy professional, our work can help you reflect, focus, and learn. Thoughtful, effective philanthropy has the power to move the needle on society's toughest issues. Find your inspiration. Make a plan. Make a difference. All right. I feel warm and fuzzy. I don't know about you. So I guess I can go on to the next slide. Just... Oh, hold on. Every year. Hit. Oh, there we go. You got it. Sorry. Oh, sorry. It's a little bit unresponsive. It just takes a second because there's a little delay. So when you click okay. it, just, yeah. Yeah. Okay. So I know that's kind of a boring slideshow, but I think what i want to emphasize is they're in the position now of transforming the understanding of philanthropy so to to be effective and strategic means to collect data to put it into the cybernetic system and to steer it right and so it's not enough to say like if you're a regular person and you have like this is not the bill gates of the you know right but because they're doing it because they they want the data for the ai but just for for regular people small time like, you know, people who maybe have, like, give a couple thousand dollars a year or whatever to nonprofits, like, they want to make you feel like you have to come up with some impact metric. Really, the metrics are being laid out for th these big portfolios, the impact finance space that are going to run on, on the data, and they need everyone to go along with it. And they need to say, like, oh, you were doing it wrong. And again, I think that the whole concept of philanthropy is the, the fact that most people met so many people's needs are not being met. I mean, philanthropy isn't like a little extra, like philanthropy at this point is life or death in many ways. And in the philanthropy is also used to steer policy and to steer social change. And, you know, what I was realizing, you know, because I, I worked in a nonprofit for a long time and, you know, we, we were doing good work, but I, I really feared the day where we were going to be asked to collect and share data that wasn't really about our how effective we were at our programs or like that that essentially our mission would have to be reshaped to some larger goals that were not necessarily what the organization was connected to initially just to be able to chase the money to chase the grants to chase the next thing and then the, not, not only to chase the grants and the programs but then to be accountable for the data in this web 3.0 environment and i just felt like it was going to be really really oppressive so i guess in some ways the, all the health stuff you know making the imperative to to move on probably preceded that but because it was a lovely place with lovely people but the the entire structure is is connected right like you have to be effective and strategic and that that means the data so they're shaping civil society that's a big part of it um if you look at the let's see it's a little blurry for me um let's see the Hang civic on, life of it. cities okay if you can make it a little bit bigger um you know the civil society people are the people who will lay out the game, right? Because they need for us to feel good about accepting our place in the game. And they're going to have all the focus groups and the events and the marketing campaigns. You know, the Stanford Social Innovation Review is right there in the middle. That's the, the publishing the article. Um, 
you know, they've got other publications about the philanthropy blueprint. They're underwriting research about civic life in the city and digital civil society. They want us to feel comfortable in their digital empire, um, global innovation impact hubs and public events and conferences. And so the work that goes into creating the mindset that will allow for the next phase to happen, that will allow for like the, the dad to scan the nutrition package. So are the grandfather, or the grandmother, so that the parents can know that the kid got some food when they're in some far off phone manufacturing facility. Like that, we're not supposed to really think about that part. We're supposed to think about the other nice parts that they sell you. And the civil society people are there to sell you all of that. So let me just go to the next. And again, she's she's the professor. That's her role is to get in there and create the educational materials, right? You credential people. It's the credential professional, and they're going to tell you how to do it correctly and give you all the tools and the dashboards and the training and the badges to show that that you know you've been credentialed into their system. So that's just her at Stanford. Um, and this is the next. I'm sorry, I'm just keeping up on two things. So, um, okay, so this is an example. Take, for example, the Jolcona Foundation, which allows people to make small donations online uh, to people living in low-income communities around the world. Jolcona gives lenders information about and access to tens of thousands of potential beneficiaries, creates a community of donors, lowers barriers of entry by reducing the cost of philanthropic transactions, and by allowing donors to receive photos and emails showing how their money is being used increases accountability. So, you know, again, this is just sort of building out what we said before, but, you know, giving lenders information about tens of thousands of potential beneficiaries. I mean, like, like, what is this, you know, Tinder for donation? You know, like, it's just, there's so much need, right? Like, there's not a recognition of why all of that need exists. And that once you're indebted to the, the people, you're supposed to share your life, right? You're supposed to share your life and and provide that. Um, the reduction in the cost of philanthropic transactions blockchain is a very big piece of that and the tokenization because you can allow micro payments, right? They want everything becomes micro and more and more atomized. So um, so that is is part of the Jolcona Foundation. So they, they want to make it sound like, hey, you as a person can like go online and, and give a few bucks to someone in Bangladesh or whatever and make a difference because they're trying to go to school to become go to coding boot camp. And that's the that's the narrative. But what I would say is the next slide is probably more accurate because these are among their advisory board members um, to Stanford um, uh, philanthropic and civil society, including Laura Arnold. So we know John and Laura Arnold are very big in the impact finance space and we went to their office building in Houston and then she's there. But these are some of the other people that are on the advisory board. They're, this may be a, a third of their board. So there's someone who works for Bloomberg Beta, which is investing in the future of work in AI. Uh, there's Felipe Medina, and he is working on transformative philanthropy and social impact in Latin America. So we know, you know, I've done a lot of work about Brazil, and we know that um, even, you know, we did that whole thing with the goofballs with their crypto gaming in, in Mexico, right? Latin America is a huge target, as well as Africa and India. Uh, we have Jeff Rakes, who is the former CEO of the Gates Foundation. He was also the head of Microsoft's business division. Uh, we have David Siegel, who got his PhD at MIT, and he had his specialty was in AI, and he founded Two Sigma, which is an algorithmic investment manager using cutting edge technology in the data rich world of finance. And then we have Darren uh, Walker, who is the president of the Ford Foundation. So if you look back and you imagine the story she's telling is like regular people, you know, or people of small family foundations just need to be better informed about the structure so they can be more effective in their giving. It's just flying in the face of the fact that um, this is about a global transformation of every aspect of our transactions with one another in the world that's going to flow through blockchain uh, that's tied to the UN Sustainable Development Goals. And, and it is about getting the interoperable data um, and creating the cybernetic twin world. Um, and philanthropy is certainly in there, but they're not planning on fixing everything through this. Didn't you have any thoughts on that, Jason? Are you there? Sorry, I keep forgetting my, I even have an easy button for my, my in 
muting myself. Uh, but I got to remember to use it. <laughs> uh, no, I agree. Uh, that's not their intention. <laughs> Um, I don't, okay. Yeah, I don't have anything else to That's say. That's all about right. That. I just, I just want to stop and like, yeah, get check make in sure with I'm me. Yeah, out. yeah, no, I'm, yeah, check yeah, it. I'm with you. Okay, so here's uh, to be most effective. Philanthropic decision making requires critical thinking as well as empathy. Would you have more impact, for example, by funding a seven year old Namibian girl's education for a year, or donating to a large MBO, NGO working with Namibia's government to to achieve universal access to secondary education. So again, it's a false choice, you know, um, and it, honestly, it, it's sidestepping the, 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 the colonizing aspect of, of Africa, right? Like why did the, the countries of Africa not have their own autonomy in managing their own educational systems and, and that they're not run by Western technological interests. And that was by design, that is by, through the, the creation, you know, as role, his, his last article on the Nigerian, or I guess article before last, on the Nigerian Civil War was very, very clear. Like you break things to create the conditions for the environment you want. And like Africa was intentionally broken over many, many times, but more recently in the 20th century, even under the guise of decolonization to sort of kneecap governments so that they would be subjected to structural adjustment and the World Bank and the IMF and the development finance aid so that now whoop, stakeholder capitalism can come in and the ESG finance and we can turn uh, Namibian girls into um, impact commodities for data aggregation. And so that's not the story that Laura Aralaga, Andresen or Mark Andresen are telling. That's not the story Mark Zuckerberg with Bridges International Academies is going to tell you that that the reason that this is a false paradigm here. Um, but we're supposed to just feel good about that we can, you know, sponsor someone, even though that that's never going to actually give people the personal agency to be independent of the system. Yeah, I just reiterate, you know, that that's a false choice. And again, both of those choices don't give any agency whatsoever to these people, but they'll give lip service. I was trying to find this clip, it was really about like some you know, blockchain uh, environmental programs. But uh, but basically the guy says, um, I'll just give a quote from the talk and then I'll maybe I'll share. It's natural. The talk is called Natural Capital Beyond Carbon and Enable Nature Backed Currencies by Icarus, Icarus <laughs> Janzen. Mm -hmm. um, I actually had posted this on a on a comment on the on the on the uh, on the forum. Uh, under the declimate climate da data marketplace, but the guy at one point he's talking about you know the tokenization of of like carbon credits and things and and uh, to to supposedly protect the environment. But there was he give a little he gave a little lip service. So I'll just read the quote. You can also you can also directly invest in projects, tokenize that project, and then basically earn all the yield. Actually, why don't I do this? Hold on. Why don't I hang on one second? Why don't I just. Uh, Boom. Look, look at that. Oh, look Boom. at you. I can actually bring it up over here. That way you guys can see it. I don't know if you guys can see that. Um, let me go. Boom. I can do full screen. Uh, anyway, so he says um, you can also directly invest in uh, projects, tokenize that project, and then basically earn all the yield of that, pro uh, that project earns over time, right? The same you could buy some land and then earn all the yield that the different projects that you may develop over time, plus the appreciation of value of the land, and you tokenize that and capture that. And then here's the interesting part. With this approach, you need to be super careful about neocolonialism and like um, being sure to involve the local community, right? Um, this needs to be part of the solution anyway, every time, because otherwise, it's not seen as a safe green asset class, right? And so I, I wrote, this statement is astounding <laughs> to me. In many ways, he openly acknowledges neocolonialism, which is precisely what this is. And then he gives some lip service uh, to involve the community um, uh, because otherwise it's not safe as a green asset class, presumably because of how it will be perceived, not what it actually is. And so I just... Um, even though that's it's dealing that's not dealing necessarily with like social impact bonds it was more green natural um natural capital uh uh class stuff but 
that that mentality is the same. Like we, we're going to listen to you. We're going to we'll give you a platform. It's kind of like when you go to your local. Um, uh, board or whatever your 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 city board uh your city council and everybody gets up and, and they testify and the city council is playing angry birds or whatever on their phone like they don't give a shit what they say but they got to do this 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 pageantry you know they're gonna let you get mm -hmm. up and they, they'll let you they'll give you a voice and hey we're gonna make a video and you get to talk about your thing and you know and it's 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 all it's all for show it, you, don't, you don't actually have any real agency in these situations mm -hmm. and the local community at the end of the day are still subservient to these givers or whatever you know mm -hmm. uh so that's just what comes to mind with that there all right yeah and I'd like to read read this. So this is just a follow up. Can you make it a little bigger? Can you do full screen on this? So this is uh, from the Shanzai City. And I, I was really glad to be able to find this article again because I lost it. And I, I just find that this image is really unsettling and captures so much like the, the little girl's face. I just really want you to look at the little girl's face because she looks like frightened and uncomfortable there. OK. So I'm going to read what it says. It says, um, this is talking about data collection on impact finance projects in rural areas. Oh, sorry. That's okay. One example is a project whose objective is to improve early childhood development through provision of nutrition aid and ECD training. Parents upload um, photographs of nutrition aid delivery, which is verified through barcodes to prove that the beneficiaries are receiving the aid they also share behavioral data and they such as children's ECD responses and academic test scores over a significant period of time. This information is used to correlate the way in which ECD aid affects the neuronal development of children who otherwise would not have access to adequate nutrition or developmentally appropriate inputs for them to reach their full potential. Moreover, all this information plus other data derived from various projects can be pulled together and analyzed using an AI-based system to produce an evaluation that can offer powerful insights, including how to improve program operations, how to scale the program, and where to deploy more capital. SCZ, that's Shanzai City, proprietary technology platform connects investors, donors, and beneficiaries, allowing anyone to be a stakeholder for change. Our platform fills the information gap in the economy of sustainable development, building a digital operating system for social finance. And then on, on the right, I just have another image of the WePlay smart table, which I've, I've written about before, but those the little blue on the corner of that, that's a fisheye lens camera. And they, they spy on those children and take their video about their social behaviors, and then they score their social behaviors as social capital. So, you know, again, just talking about um, you know, this idea that these platforms give donors access to all these potential beneficiaries. Like, this is what it looks like. Does this feel good? Like, this, this doesn't feel good to me. I mean, not that I want anyone to go hungry, but this, this does not feel like a humane, this does not feel altruistic, charitable, anything. Um, and it's about getting the data and it's about the AI analytics, because again, they were linking behavioral data in there. And I would say that this is probably based, if I had to guess, um, on the Chicago social impact bond that was working on, in conjunction with like family, like community family programming. So they had a number of impact data points around special education and early literacy, but they were also around parent involvement. So um, they really want to have surveillance on the entire family system. And if you think about what Fritz Kunst was saying and Sorokin about this field theory of ethics, like they want the inner dynamics of the child and the family all together. Um, so I just, again, th this is not the image that Laura and Mark are gonna pull up, I don't think, or maybe if they did, they would get a better Photoshopped image of someone who seemed to be happier about the scanned barcode nutrition package. Um, but I mean, this is the reality of what, it, what, what we're dealing with. Okay, so the next one says open source, or open source code, online procurement, and off-the-shelf customer relationship management software, low-cost technologies on which industries from retail to travel rely can all increase philanthropy's efficiency and effectiveness. So again, I think, you know, as someone who spent a lot of time using database systems and they, they weren't terribly satisfying, um, and actually we were using, I think, 
was it MailChimp at the time? And there was all of these AI things that were rolling out and it was really disconcerting to see, like I never used any of them, but clearly that these, these communication platforms and customer relationship software programs were, are, are built with really high level um, <clears throat> targeting and maybe, you know, at some point, maybe even neural marketing or something. Um, it's, it's unsettling. And again, the, the efficiency and effectiveness are the key words because that is what what's about the, the data, the data analytics. And so, Jason, I just want to mention, like, so the next slide on the open source space. So this is from Common Stack, And I was looking into a guy that was with Block Sciences um, work because I know Leo has been doing a lot of looking into that in terms of the um, alpha bonds or the bonding curves and and how that all works, which I, I'm still not totally clear on, uh, yeah, augmented bonding curves. But the, I think the goal is to frame all of this as the commons, the common good. And again, you know, many people talk about collectivism, you know, some people frame that as socialist or communist or technocrats or communitarianism, or there's a lot of different ways to frame it. But they're, they're, they're taking this, this idea of authentic connectivity of people in community and then putting it through this technological sieve and then acting, acting us to like perform our communal obligations through these tokens and then, and then mining the data for that and then putting govern, governing situations like in terms of compliance and feedback loops onto all of this. But because they frame it as like open source and like free and or you can own your data and you can be a data commodity. And don't you feel good about that? Like these are all the tropes that are used to make us embrace something that is ultimately going to profoundly sideline natural life on the planet, in my opinion. And I just want to chime in. I'm someone who very much believes in a commons, depending on how you frame it, uh, you know, d depending on how that that <laughs> that's the, the definition you would put to that word. But I do believe that there are things that are it's, it's that we all should have access to and we should all participate in uh, or we should have be have the ability to participate in but that's not what this is about because once you look at the fact that there are these economic components and um you know financial markets attached to this uh the what you th what what it's being presented as is not not in reality what it actually is so i just thought i would chime in there did you want to say something about open source too? Because I know we talked a little bit about that, the open source yeah. narrative. Yeah. Um, just... Yeah. Oh, hold on. Let me get you off this. Boom. Okay. <laughs> Boom. Okay. <laughs> too many windows. Ah. Too many um, buttons. Yeah. I mean, that's another thing about that. I've looked at it because I, I was someone who was like, oh my gosh, open source. Yes. It's all transparent and everybody can see it. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm reading a book about protocol and, and just realizing that, well, a couple things about open source is that even, even if it is transparent and people can read the code, if you can't understand the code and very few people are going to actually be able to understand what the code is because it's so complex, you know, and, and who has the resources to, to do that. I, I attended the smart cities con, uh, Smart Cities Week. It was a, a little conference that happened in Denver like a month and a half ago, and um, there was a woman there that was like promoting digital twins. And but she was like, "Oh," but, and they kept saying, "But it's open source and it's going to be transparent. It's an open source." And I asked the lady, I was like, "Well, you as it was someone with the I think she was with the city of of Tucson actually." Um, I'm like, "Well, do you have the resources to actually have someone who would understand what what the code is is doing and and actually have a an analysis of it?" And and she, clearly she said, you know, the answer was no. Um so like I think it's kind of a it's a little bit misleading to say, "Oh, it's because it's open source." And again, it's open source, but there's a protocol that already has limitations and restrictions on it. So like uh, Richard Stallman, who's who's one of the big advocates of, of free software, free does in like freedom, you, you can do whatever you want with it versus free, you know, you don't have to pay for it. But, um, you know, he talked a lot about like Android and he's like, you know, they, Android, which was created by Google, which is on a lot of people's phones, is open source. But here I am with a phone. I, I cannot. This phone has you know, I have to try to root it, which I, you know, I know there's some ways to do it. Some, some phones you can root, some phones you can't uh, very easily without breaking it. But anyways, but the idea that's open source, I still don't have this, this phone that I have. 
I still, there, I don't have control over it. Like there's a lot of stuff on there that I don't want on there, but it's open source, you know. I like that, that there's something floating around you that I don't know what. I know. I, well, this time of day, the, the, the light comes in our little side door. And so it's really it's <laughs> nice. Very I see, it's anyway, a nice. You'll see that. The dust. It's a, it's a nice. It's <laughs> I don't a nice notice effect. how dusty my house. They're they're orbs. <laughs> they're visitors from I, another. I, no, no. Hopefully not nano dust or anything. Like they're just regular dust. It's all nano um, dust. Just just deal with it. <laughs> but yeah, okay, I think a lot see. of these things are deceptive. I mean, even like I want to do a thing about democracy itself. Like you know, the United States has been promoting democracy around the world since when, since World War One, really. And, and why are they promoting democracy? They, they clearly, the, the, the people behind this, the, the people in power aren't really interested in democracy. But what it is, what democracy is, is um, it's manufactured consent. It gives people the perception that they're participating mm -hmm. when they don't really have any real participation or real power over anything. But it, it's just, it's about perception. It's perception management. Yeah, perception um, management. And so people have like, oh, I, I have my token. Therefore, I voted. I voted. I got my little, look at my sticker. See my sticker? That means I'm a, I'm a mm -hmm. citizen and I have a say in things. Uh, but if you actually step back and look at the actual structure of it, it's, it's none of that. <laughs> it's, a, it's a controlled system. <laughs> And so it's, it's so even saying that open source, like I'm just like open source. Of course, I like open source better than proprietary. I mean, the discord thing is open source, but I don't have any illusions that that it's it's really mine. Like, I mean, uh, it's, it's still their technology. So. All right. Let's see. All right. Oh, so oops, I, think I'm, 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 I think I need to go back. OK, so. Um, so uh, an organization, a company that not a lot of people talk about in the space, in the tech space lately is Hewlett Packard. Um, you know, we, we, we talk about the, the you know, the, the cutting edge emerging tech and oracles and IBMs and whatever, but HP isn't one, like you sort of think printers, like, oh, it's like crappy printers that don't work really well, or they have to always get the drivers on running out of ink or something like that's what I used to think when I thought about Hewlett Packard, but I didn't realize about their involvement in like biomedical space or also like the biometric border control in Gaza, like they're in a lot of different stuff. And uh, so I had spent some time when I was doing my blog early on in the first couple of years, looking at the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation, primarily around open education resources, which are these online content modules that students were supposed to interact with and that would create all of this metadata. And then eventually those would be linked into virtual reality uh, simulation, gaming simulations. And their giving areas, they had like three different giving areas and, and OER was one of them, but effective philanthropy was the other one. So effective, you've noticed Laura using that word over and over again. Um, I just pulled this. This was from last year. It said last year they gave 47 grants uh, and $10 million. That's just in one year. I mean, they're giving so much money away. Um, and they are the ones that essentially laid out what the new version of philanthropy was going to be. And William and Flora Hewlett Foundation is very much also a donor to Stanford. And as I said, she, they were backing her book launch. And so Hewlett Packard is really important in the space and people should be familiar with what they're doing in terms of remaking philanthropy. Um, these are just, I guess, the latest grants. So Bridgespan is is one of the, 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 the policy groups that's putting all this stuff in. They got um, $5 million Rockefeller Philly Rockefeller Philanthropy Advisors, you know, they got 1.6 million. Uh, so these aren't grants are not going to small organizations for the most part, although they did end up like buying off, you know, all the crowdfunding software, all of the philanthropy publications, a lot of the identity politics related small scale organizations, and they they, they can buy those off for, you know, $50,000, $60,000 a pop. Um, but then they give the big money to their other philanthropies that are and consulting firms that are setting up the policy infrastructure to run the ESG capital flows. So, um, so that's just an example of the, so these are not little people. These are not the little people running the philanthropy movement. These are, these are think tanks and foundations that are setting up the pipelines for the data flows. Now, uh, in this space, you know, you remember that I said that her SV2 Silicon Valley social venture partners were, um, 
incubated in the Silicon Valley Community Foundation. So this is a, a recent press release uh, from January that they, they're talking about their new board members for the Silicon Valley Community Foundation, uh, one of whom is uh, Scott uh, Cooper, Cooper uh, who is a managing partner of Andreessen Horowitz. There you go. And before he was at Andreessen Horowitz, he was a manager of software as service at Hewlett Packard. So there we've got Hewlett Packard. So you'll, you'll see on the right is a, is a link to a post that I did where I actually spent time to go through every single effective philanthropy uh, grant post that HP did back in the day, and this is probably maybe 2018, and put it on a little sys map. Now, this map mostly eliminated, although I have I have a few image screenshots of them that I don't have um, the interactive ones, clearly maps that they necessarily want floating around. But I was really very thoughtful to see like, what money are they giving and to whom? And you could really, I'll, I'll show an image. It, it doesn't have a lot of detail, but just the constellation of, okay, so they, they bought the press, they bought the policy infrastructure, they bought you know the academic groups, they bought the identity politics groups, like they just consistently went out and, and you have to kind of give them credit. I mean, they're very disciplined about getting what they want done, done. I mean, they, they do it. The, the problem is, is that nobody else knows that it's happening or what the ultimate implications are. Okay, so this is another quote. Um, Even so, there are many barriers to information sharing because really they want the information. Uh, from lack of transparency and legal considerations to concerns that highlighting poor performance might drive donors away from an organization. Again, the human element comes into play. After all, who really enjoys talking about failures, mistakes, financial inconsistencies, and shortcomings? And who wants to denigrate publicly an organization with good social change intentions? Technology can take us only so far as we are willing to go. And again, sorry, this is really it's bright. The sun is shining. Um, so this is, oh, looking, I've got like a lot of bright sun on me. Um, maybe I can stack <laughs> some more books. Let me just see. Um, I, hopefully I don't, well, maybe is that enough to stop? The, you still stack? got like okay. a, yeah. I know, a halo. Maybe I can, maybe I can move to the other side of the, Room. I Just mean, I, I, I don't think people care if, 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 as long as it's not distracting you. Oh, well, I'm looking kind of weird. Let me just see. Sorry. <laughs> this is, can you see me now? Yep. This is the other side of the room. Okay. So maybe we'll do this. Um, yeah. So, sorry. You just get situated. <laughs> this is not exactly how I would do it. Oh, it's a long day. All right. Um, I need more books stacked, I think. Just, sorry. sorry, guys. I can edit this part out. <laughs> Wait a minute. I need a book. I need the little I need the little screen that we cut to where it's like, please stand by. Please stand by. You know. <laughs> We're not prof I'm not a professional. I won't say anything about you. You're you are professional, Jason, but right. I, I don't I actually <laughs> don't like the, the word professional. I, to me it's, it's Oh a bad that's word. right. Okay. <laughs> I'm not really into professionals. <laughs> <laughs> that's true. Okay. I, I'll go there with you about that. Okay. So all right, next. Um okay, so they're talking about they want information, right? And the framing again is that, well, you know, the organizations are not providing the information because they're doing bad things and they don't want to tell people about it, right? That's, it's shaming, right? Who wants to talk about the bad grants you gave, right? And how often does that really happen, honestly? But two, do you really think that these big organizations like Hewlett Packard, like the HP Foundation or Ford, are, or they're interested in like true accountability? I just, I'm just not buying it, right? So really what they're, they're, they're trying to shame people into the fact that they have to give up the data, that they have to create the data architecture. Because the only reason you wouldn't create the data architecture is not because that you don't want to surveil millions of low-income people in the global south or homeless people in Silicon Valley, is that you're just, you're, you don't want to share because you're embarrassed. And that's, that's the, the way that's been set up here. I don't know, would you agree? Yeah, I would agree. And yeah, there's and there's other reasons why people wouldn't want to share that that and and there's a lot of reasons why they shouldn't share that they don't even know themselves. Like the the ability to manipulate like whole popula whole populations based on data is it's a lot of people still 
have a hard time wrapping their mind around. I'm, I'm still astounded yeah. at people that have, uh, I mean, even people of resources that will buy a ring or will buy an Alexa or, you know, right. I, I'm like, really? <laughs> yeah. Well, so these are just a couple of the maps I made. So you can see I, I did do the work. <laughs> it got kind of memory hold, but most of it. And the, the lower one is like their grants to universities. So they're they're giving to, um, I'm trying to, you know, these are, these are the big ones, right? Like Duke and Stanford, Stanford got there. You know, you've got Duke. Duke is really big also in the, the, the global development aid. Um, Johns Hopkins, Georgetown, uh, Penn, Harvard, like these are, th this is who you give to. You want to re restructure the system. This is who you're giving to. So, so the archetype of Laura Alvarolega and Drayson is there to tell you how to do philanthropy right. And this is what all of the best universities say is best practice is to get all of the data and have it all interoperable and in real time. So, and then I would just say, I think the next one is a, is this IXO clip. I don't know if you can make it play with sound. Jason. Yep, I can. So, yeah, this is the this is the Sean Conway, the Ampli, what we're really doing here. Um, Stig Mergy at the beginning. Never before have we had such a unique opportunity to make a positive impact on the world. What really matters now is educating for the future averting climate change, and ensuring that no person gets left behind. One of the biggest challenges in delivering, evaluating, and investing for results is a lack of good quality, trusted impact data. To count what matters, we need high definition data with crypto economic oh. proof of impact. What if you could track and value the impact of your contributions on people and the planet? Introducing ICSO, the blockchain for impact. Driven by data and optimized by AI, ICSO provides a trusted global information network that is owned by everyone. This enables you to become the creator of your own impact projects and a stakeholder in the projects you believe in. The ICSO protocol ensures that impact claims are verified with the help of intelligent evaluation oracles. Oracles. Verified data is a valuable digital asset and is minted as an impact token. This enables us to value what counts. Now you can watch projects around the world grow in value as they generate proof of impact. In the time you took to watch this video, Ixo could have verified exponential impacts across the world. Enabling people like Nahal to have a future. If this is the impact we can have in 90 seconds, imagine what we can do together to achieve the global goals to end poverty, protect the planet, and ensure prosperity for everyone by 2030. Yuppers. Protect the planet. I mean, for me, honestly, if we, like, if people have questions about what the climate stuff is, like, send them. <laughs> it's like two minutes, right? And say, is do you actually authentically believe that this is going to fix the world, right? That you're going to put refugees in a blockchain box and slope them into the grid, and you're going to paint every tree with a tracking mechanism, and you're going to, I mean, I just... I don't know. I, I can't get my mind around how people can see that as an authentic solution. Right. And not, not understand that this is just a further concentration of wealth and power in the people who develop the next game. Like, it's just so clear to me. I don't, I mean, I've never had anyone that I've shared this with, like, push back on it. Like, I'm, I'm just curious if they would. Like, how, how would, does someone, I don't know. To me, it, 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 people are of, of this sort of short term memory me meme culture thing. Two minutes is not an, too much to ask people to actually spend on something and then uh, sit with it, like sit with that and understand that's where we're going. Yeah. And there's another company called Blockchain. Uh, I'm sorry, Chainlink. It's, it's the company's called Chainlink. And they're they're pretty integral in actually doing the, the piece of it where they collect the data 
to you'll have to hit it one more time to there you go uh to to, to actually collect the data to to um because it's a lot of these will be on smart contracts and decentralized autonomous organizations yeah. DAOs, uh and so the, the question is how do you get that data um that's going to um complete complete the transaction and so there's a blockchain called uh, a company called uh chain link that that's you should look into in terms that uh it, that's also really relevant there as as well but yeah i mean yeah. if you look at it they're like you know putting you know they're all proud of like putting cam you know filling up the forest with sensors and cameras and and drones flying above and satellites and massive data centers and how how people can say that this is good for the ecology is yeah like you said it's it's like there's just an unbelievable disconnect um and then and then not even leaving aside you know all the financial schemes um uh, and, and it's 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 really a lot of these things if, if you take them down are they're really ponzi schemes that are just trying to um decorate themselves with do-gooding <laughs> you know it's it's yeah. like a it's like a, but people a, really want to be good yeah for sure uh and i've talked about this too that it, it goes back to even king leopold like king leopold who was literally brutal brutal a person uh uh with slavery and and just beatings and torture and killing uh people in the congo and uh, but if you read the papers at the time like he was this great philanthropist and so it's this it's always philanthropy is always this cover um for at at the end of the day domination so yeah well this is just a quote there it said in ancient times it was archimedes lever that could move the world in today's philanthropic world technology is one of the most powerful levers in our hands so that's the lever and i guess they're they're just looking for a place to stand at this point that's Looking for a place to stand and use their lever. So collective giving is also and powered loot. by technology. Oh, you did a Freudian slip. I think you said and loot. <laughs> oh, never. Sorry, I interrupt mean, you. I'm no, sorry. I, I yeah, thought it was okay. funny. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah, I maybe I just yeah. I'm I'm flagging a bit. I know it's a long slide deck. I'm gonna get there. Um, okay, so collective giving is also powered by technology, allowing individual givers to pool their resources online in virtual giving circles. For example, chain gang change gangs <laughs> not, change gangs unites a group of giving circles donating to pets, poverty alleviation, and veterans. As people reach out to their networks, donors who don't otherwise know each other can coalesce around a cause or issue. So when I read that, I sort of feel, I think a lot about, um, like I've heard of giving circles. And now in retrospect, you sort of, once you get the new vocabulary, you think, oh, okay, well, are we talking cybernetics? Is the circle the circuit? And, you know, I look back at my time in the nonprofit space and think about like all of the things that we were, and I'm not saying we were intent, like meant anything wrong, but like there would be you know, competitions where nonprofits were supposed to compete for some small prize, like some a small award and like have all of your people go on and vote for you, right? Do online voting or, um, you know, we even had dinners, this wasn't ours, but like would host like this community, these community organizations, you will host a dinner and then you like vote on the, on the project to get the money at the end. And so it was always this sort of competitive aspect to it. And, and I see about collective giving, um, you know, when I, I see that, I feel like this is also sort of part of the signals intelligence program, because if what they're seeking is sort of an identification of if these people hold these values, and again, we're going all the way back to Sorokin and Kunst and sort of catalyzing new life through the development of values from maybe, you know, less complex life forms, right? But if, if, if we can identify with metadata, the people who like this also like that, or, you know, to what degree or how many, and I, I feel like the signals intelligence piece is really important. And we've been conditioned to do our fundraising and our advocacy online without most people understanding the way in which the social change agents are coming from the back end. I mean, I think a lot of people are increasingly are understanding like color revolutions and the role of Twitter and that, but 
that these are these are military tools that are being used in ways that we don't understand and used on the back end. And I know Jason, you know, you you personally have had experiences with comments and things being managed in online forums in ways that are very deceptive and confusing and uh, manipulative. Um, and we both have. That's why we're trying to figure out some other options. But I feel like they want for people who are like-minded to coalesce and they want to document that and track that. And I think that's part of swarm intelligence. And then I also think this whole, again, this whole idea that these are individual people just individually making, you know, donations to pets, that is distracting from that the that UBS Bank and BNP Paribas are going to run giant pools of capital through women in addiction in Connecticut who are involved in child protective services. Like they're going to use the, the 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 you know homeless stray pets issue to provide cover for this much larger problem i think that the term chain change gangs <laughs> i i i, I, no. I there's <laughs> i got to we need to make a movie about that it it there, is your kid involved in change gangs <laughs> yeah well, so can we make this one a little bigger? Can we look mm -hmm. at this full screen? So this is, um, I, I had a post about this on the discourse page, but I was really intrigued by Michael Zargam, uh, who was one of the founders of Block Science. And, and um, I didn't realize that he actually was uh, educated at Penn and he got his PhD in, I guess, engineering in the GRASP lab, which is working on swarm intelligence. And uh, he had done some work in crypto economics in Vienna, and I think Vienna is sort of a center for the circular economy. But he was also working on the common stack, um, I think, as an ecosystem architect, uh, where they were working on aligning incentives with public goods. So this is like economic modeling and behavioral modeling is the incentivization of, of activities and behaviors. But he's also a systems engineering advisor with Shanzai City. So the, the folks, you know, the picture of the little girl and the dad with the phone scanning the food, that's that that's Shansai City. So so Zargam is connected in a lot of different ways. And his he, he presented recently at this. Uh, actually, that was 2018. So not recently, five years ago already, almost um, a future of trust uh, meeting at The Hague with Vinay Gupta and some other folks. Um, and, and it seems like respects the Netherlands is a big leader in, in this, in this sort of digital empire building, especially in the diversity ecosystem, biodiversity space, um, the taxonomy space. So I just want to say the next um, slide that I have is by his PhD, his dissertation advisor. And some of the, the, the work he did as a, as a graduate assistant or whatever was underwritten by the Army and the Navy as part of this ARO MURI agreement. I mean, I think that's the army one. He also had a navy one. But I, I found this uh, slide, short slide deck, uh, with that was prepared by his uh, dissertation advisor, who I think has since moved on to MIT. But it's talking about the evolution of cultural norms and the dynamics of socio-political change. So the way they're presenting it is like within the democracy frame, like, oh, we're going over in these countries that are not doing it right, we will change their social norms and get them on board with the, the proper democratic construct, right? We, we will do, it's regime change. We'll go, we're going in and we're going to fix the, how, their, their bad behaviors. But what I'm saying is I think that many of these things are actually also linked to changing behaviors for us as U.S. citizens into metaverse the metaverse life like that's a socio-political change the new political regime is going to be the metaverse and that's mark mark andresen is very very clear about that so um this is one of the slides talks about how you do it how you use social contagion and it's a, it's a sense of coordinating network science economic science and systems theory to engage and model the social action that you find is desirable. So this is very much a science and very much linked to military technology. And, um, oh, okay. So here, here's a, another quote from the, from the paper. More effective collaboration tools are needed. How might technology allow geographically dispersed people to tackle a social issue together? And could algorithms analyzing social media's ripple effect create evidence to inspire deeper commitments and help campaign leaders guide supporters on which actions to take. So to me, when I'm pulling that out, what I'm reading underlyingly is they want to analyze um, online social interactions across geographies and use algorithms to change behaviors. And they will use the data to guide you in how to act, 
how to act in, a, in, in the social change structure that is desirable. So this is situated within philanthropy, but I think that there's something deeper going on here. So now we're back to the slide share, um, and this is the agenda of the day. Um, Jason, could I see this full size? Yeah. Um, so the, 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 one of the morning sessions was by Larry Bloom at Cornell, and he was talking about evolutionary games and modeling of social interaction. Uh, then before lunch, there was an evolution of social norms by Matt Jackson from Stanford. Um, after lunch, there was uh, competitive contagion and behavioral experiments by Michael Kearns, who's at Penn, uh, followed by closing the day, influencing social evolutionary dynamics with Jeff Shama, Georgia Tech, and social learning and belief aggregation by Ali Jad. Bobby at Penn, and I think now he's at MIT. So some of these people have moved on since this was 2018. But they're looking at evo like gaming, evolution, simulation, um, like societal risk and social change, and how that is engineered through technological systems. And I think that that's really, really vitally important to, to understand the way in which uh, blockchain is going to be used, because it's going to actually document your past behavior and values and use that to shape who you become. So let me just go forward. Next slide. Oh. Okay, so here's one. Um, the connectivity of the web and social media means anyone can launch a giving movement or an advocacy campaign, informing and inspiring thousands of people at relatively low financial cost. At Nation and Nation Builder, an online community organizer tool, enables nonprofits to reach and manage large populations of supporters, donors, and activists. And again, I would say that this is people like from my own personal experience with little sis, I didn't fully appreciate the extent to which data on the back end is being monitored and used to look at things systemically. So I would say that this is very much about open source signals intelligence. And, um, and again, Raul did a, a really nice article about that early on about Arthur Toynbee, who's, who's actually a central feature. I want to talk about a little bit later in the, um, settlement movement, uh, reform movement, uh, but he was a historian. He wrote sort of this big history, and I think in some ways control of history is also control of the future, um, but he, he was central to the, the creation of open source intelligence. And so what they had during World War II was vastly different from the data aggregation they have now and the supercomputing capacity. So I don't know, Jason, do you have any thoughts? I have zero thoughts. I don't know what happened. They just went. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, I can't tell if you're there or not. So I just no, no. I just, I'm here. I'm here. I'm here. And I'm also trying to. I'm trying to track the the comments as well. But are there yeah, still I mean, people again, commenting? Oh yeah, there's, there's still discussion. <laughs> there's some people. Okay. Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, again, the open source intelligence. So just thinking about open source in those in those in that context. Um, you know, I, it's, Here, I, 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 I myself, and organize. <laughs> well, and, and again, I, I was, you know, pretty big advocate of open source and, and, and certain aspects of it. I still am, you know, like I'm not really down with a lot of the proprietary stuff. I think we should like, I think information should be free. And, um, but yeah, it's, it's, it's a, it's pretty apparent at this point that there's, it's, it's, it's more useful f for their, for their system to have it be open source. In well, fact, they need it to I be open source. Say, clear that like this particular open source is like dates to World War II. Mm -hmm. So it was about using um, like pattern seeking from publicly available material, like media publications or letters or things that were in the public sphere and doing sort of a broad assessment of like sentiment analysis, really like today's sentiment analysis, um, using publicly available material for strategic ends, like geopolitical ends. And so <clears throat> they developed very sophisticated programs. And actually, in some ways, uh, I think what came out of that later was the British Council. I can't remember if the British Council predated or came directly after that. But the idea that you create the, these sort of ambassadorships of culture and goodwill in different countries, and then you're able to take the temperature, so to say, you know, of, of different environments from what's not necessarily, um, you know, secret intelligence, but things that are just out there, but looking at it in a very comprehensive and intentional way. And so now imagine all of that that they, they accomplished then put into metadata with layered data analytics and AI. It's just, it's, it's, it's a whole new ball game. It yeah, comes someone, from somewhere. And it, someone in the comments mentioned uh, IBM Hollerith, uh, which was, uh, what was the name of it? Uh, 
can't think of it. But yeah, I, I, the IBM uh, Dehamag, it was Dehamag, the German subsidiary. Uh, well, they, I would say too on the IBM, like, and I, I'm always chiming in on South Africa that that IBM was integral to the apartheid program. Yeah, well. that's what I was going to mention. That's yeah. why I brought that up. That even yeah. you've mentioned it's even more relevant is the fact that uh, IBM was using in in apartheid South Africa. Uh, they were they were doing the track tracking of people, um, which is probably even more relevant to to what we're facing right now. Um, I have yeah. the book. I'll I'll find it back there. So, um, okay. So many of the cost saving services powered by the web are not specifically targeted at the nonprofits. Nevertheless, as the sharing economy expands, the potential savings and efficiency gains are tremendous. Whether nonprofits use TaskRabbit to outsource errands and administration, Airbnb to find inexpensive accommodations while traveling, or Lyft to find background check community drivers. Cost savings and increased efficiency benefit donors too. With lower transaction costs and leaner operations, a high percentage of philanthropic dollars flow into programs and services, ultimately improving the lives of many more people. So again, in this, like we're not looking at it structurally, Laura. <laughs> you know, we're, we're not really dealing with the fact that the techno economy is planned to dispossess most people out of jobs they care about and dehumanize a lot of the service sector um, and the knowledge sector and leave people with miserable jobs of providing behavioral data analytics. And the very fact that they would uplift TaskRabbit, which is the, in the entire gig economy, which is destabilizing everything that's about normal society, I think says a lot. So, um, and real quick, uh, real quick, I found the, the book. Uh, anyways, it's called. Oh, uh, yeah, Think Black. Yeah. Think Black. So, if you want to read about IBM in, uh, I'm trying to frame it. Uh, yeah. IBM. His father in, was in, the first black executive at, at IBM, and then he followed in his footsteps. So. Yeah. Okay. So let me. Uh, cool. So Taylorism, Taylorism came out of Philadelphia Quakers. All right. Efficiency. Ruthless if efficiency. one piece of candy gets past you and into the packing room unwrapped, you're fired. Yes, ma'am. Let her go. fighting a losing game what do you think i think we're fighting a losing game That's i don't think, I think so i don't think we're fighting a losing <laughs> game actually no but, but I think we, we can't play that game we, we we can't if play, you play that game that's a losing game like that's yeah. what i guess what i'm saying like the conveyor belt is the losing game because that only speeds up until only the robots can wrap the chocolates when thinking about the gig economy too just the 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 insecurity that people are gonna have last chance. Oh, if one, it one more time right. There we go. Uh, I don't know why it doesn't just jump to the next slide. It seems like know. a flaw in the, their design because when you click it again after you've already played it, it should, anyway, whatever. But yeah, the gig economy is going to create massive insecurity, job insecurity. You're going to have little gig work, uh, piecemeal gig work, and you're going to be competing with the entire world. <laughs> All right. You know, uh, it, yeah. Well, remember the, the Simpsons clip with the, the Lyft drivers in the, like, they're, they're not even actually in the real car. They're driving. The yeah. But the thing is like that, that shows how tone deaf these people are. They're like, sign up for all the things that are like terrible job opportunities to take advantage of for your nonprofit to be more efficient with the philanthropic money. I mean, it's a really twisted outlook. And I think it just shows how far off everything is. So, um, so I would say, so for organizations, technology is 
um, is no less powerful a tool. By using technology such as 3D printing, computer modeling and simulation, nonprofits can create prototypes and test the effectiveness and practicality of social interventions and shift courses necessary. Feedback loops, that's the cybernetics, can be embedded into social service programs at greater scale, speed, and accuracy. With multiple choice assessments or quizzes for each module, online learning gives teachers real-time feedback on whether or not content and methods are proving effective. Okay, so I just want to emphasize here, like the computer modeling and simulation, so that's the digital twinning, the prototypes of effectiveness, so again, that's lean function, and that's the speeding up the conveyor belt, uh, the creation of feedback loops as cybernetics, and that, um, you know, she's very involved in, ed, in the ed tech space. Uh, she was on the Robin Hood Foundation's ed tech advisory board and pushing online learning because the online learning, uh, it's not just giving teachers real time feedback, it's creating feedback for the impact markets and for the AI. So um, the next slide is another video, Jason. And this is the one that I've shown before, but I just, I think it's really important. This is from, Rocket Ship Academy Charter School. It's using Clever, which is a QR code identity system to sign in that kids use to sign in for their online learning programs that aggregates all the data. The students at this age, they are fun to be around. You can introduce any type of subject, topic, and they're just really eager to learn. I usually log them in with their username and password. This is very hard for them because they don't know their letters and they don't know their numbers. How do I expect for them to log in? And, and, and typing in their username and password can take between a minute to five minutes, just depending on the student. And it pretty much all laid back on me for me to log them in. At first, when we met the Clever team and they came and they introduced this new concept, we're crossing our fingers because it's definitely going to change our life and our kids' lives to log into their computers. Clever Badge is a new tool that our TKs are using in the classroom. They get to wear it and then they get to decorate it in the back and then they scan their barcode and are easily logging into their online learning programs. I feel like this is going to be a time saver for me because I will definitely get to use those extra minutes that I have for intervention programs that I run even to help the students go on online learning programs. If they have any questions, I feel like I can easily help them more. When they logged in using their username and password, they weren't really excited about it. Now I feel like I've seen right away that they're so eager and excited to even log in to use their online learning programs. I really want them to enjoy school and think of it as a positive. We want our students to strive and be the best that they can. Jason, that makes me so sad. You and I both, yeah, it's pretty depressing. And 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 certainly it's it's we talk about this all the time, but what just blows my mind is just the majority of people that are per, to doing this and pursuing this are um well intentioned, I think. You know, they they believe it. They're just put in a bad situation. Like that teacher's like, "Here, log all these 30 kids in." Like it is impossible, right? So then they give you the solution and the thing is, they don't even get to decorate their own, like they don't, can, they can't even draw their own picture for their ID. They're given stickers. So it's like every time they scan in, it's like, here you are as a commodity. Here's a reminder you're the data commodity. Here's a reminder you're just a number. And then even the thing that you're allowed to self express yourself, it's like from a sheet of stickers somebody made. And like, you know, I, I like a sticker, you know, I'm not just saying like, but it's not even, they're already pre-programmed. I, I was, I was, I pulled another video of a class craft gamified behavior management system. And it's like, okay, so you can be the mage, the warrior or the witch, or, you know, like there were a few fixed options and that's all you got, right? So if you didn't fit, you had to mold your identity onto that thing. And um, this is what the cybernetic feedback loop looks like. I mean, that's, that's what it is. And then, um, um, you know, UNICEF is all over that. UNICEF is at Singularity University. Their innovation fund is based there. So again, you've got little girls on tablets. You've got girls in VR headsets and all in the magenta. Uh, you know, here, improving reading skills with VR. What, so you slap something on your face 
that you can't see and that improves your reading? I don't think so, right? And you know, the AR VR portfolio. So they're they're they're, they're trapping children in the virtual world. Um, you know, again, Laura Aralaga is not trotting out like, oh, we're, we're training kids to work in an Amazon warehouse fulfillment center. Um, you know, that's our real time data analytics because we want to know um, what their eye focus was as they, you know, were in the game. Like that's the real time feedback loops that we're talking about. Um, and and it's sick. <laughs> like, I just don't see how anyone could see that. And, and that's why I need more like we we need to amplify this message. Like we need to get this message out more broadly, but in such a frustrating way, like they've already decided the narratives, like the narratives are sex ed in schools or social emotional learning in schools or these things, which again, I'm not saying that inherently that those aren't problematic, but the bigger problem is that we're building a global economy where kids are gonna have to strap on a VR headset and put their brain in a video game to do any kind of work. And like that affects everybody's kids, right? Because ultimately it's also a race to the bottom. Like I don't want anybody's kids to have to race against the kids in Kenya to do some sort of like hotel robot cleaning job. I mean, that's not gonna work out well for anybody. So we need to fight that paradigm, but I don't know how to effectively communicate the nature of that threat because no one's pay everyone's like well i'm just doing this like they're literally following following these talking heads who are just yeah. like walking them off the cliff like right. and and further inflaming the, the the polarization the political ideology the different things where like this is not political this is not political and this isn't actually i would say even really a class issue because when it comes right down to it there's going to be a very thin veneer of a managerial class running this the billionaires and everybody else so anyone who wants to continue to make it about the class aspect doesn't actually get what the future program is. Like there's going to be no middle class. There's not going to be much of a professional class. There's going to be the, the technocrat managers, the billionaires and everybody else. And I just well, don't, we need a new lens. Yeah. Well, I, I think too, like a lot of people like, they're like, oh, that's something I got to learn new. And I'm already, I'm already focused on this thing over here. And, and maybe they don't think that this is like, this is just a side thing. And, and I've, I've been saying, and you've been saying, it's like, no, this is the thing. This is what this is uh, all of this health stuff that's been going on is to steer us into this. It's a catalyst for this. And people are, are you know, it's it's the pro proverbial forest for the trees sort of thing. Like, like this, this is the forest. And, and if you don't yeah. understand why all this is happening and, and where all this is headed, you know, we're, we're in big trouble. Um, and this isn't just like some unimportant thing. This is a thing. But I think we're, you know, if you go back at our, our content, progress. it's 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 all there. You know, it's all there, but it requires it requires some dedication and saying, oh, I'm going to actually learn something new. I'm not just going to find some other piece that fits into my current understanding of things, which is what we do as humans. We have a foundation of how we think the world operates. And then we 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 pull in oh new new information where it's like, no, this is actually like a radical shift. Even people that talk about economics from like a historical lens is like this is this completely changes the entire game yeah. it's still a game it's still domination i mean there's still aspects of it that are similar but um yeah i mean i think we just need to keep trying <laughs> but it, it is yeah. i i, I your i feel your frustration it's hard to do materialism in hyperspace right you know and the <laughs> thing is it's militarized so that's this next slide is just that the, the kid in the ar glasses in the warehouse um that was from jca solutions and this this is back in 2018 right so it's a while ago and that was a defense contracting uh, simulation program so these are defense contractors that are setting up stuff to train your kid because it's cheaper than having a teacher uh, and it gets more data so here's one using mobile technology communities themselves can report directly on local challenges and come up with their own solutions take Crisis Text Line, the brainchild of social entrepreneur Nancy Lublin, CEO of DoSomething.org. Using this service, teens can reach a counselor 24-7 via text. Crisis Text Line has also tapped into the power of data. An algorithm gathers every word used in the text and gives real-time prompts to counselors, suggesting that they ask certain questions and provide specific information. Now, the thing that's so horrific about this is like when I first like went went in January, 2020, and met Lynn and we were hanging out and I, you know, I was at her house doing some, I was, I guess I was mapping, probably still doing little sis maps. And I came across Nancy Lublin and the craziest thing was like, 
It turned out Nancy Lublin was also the founder of this thing called Loris AI, which literally hoovered up all of that text sentiment analysis data into a corporate platform used to trail call, train call center employees. Like this is the most like intimate, fragile like data about someone like someone who's looking to harm themselves right and you, you've got this data and you're just using it as any other data set um to to train like to create corporate value out of and it turns out that loris is actually a poisonous lemur and it used to be that on their website they, they made a point of telling you that that the loris was a poisonous lemur and so and you know, by the way, they're using the suicide texts to um, train their AI call center program. Now, evidently, like maybe just this past year, they got called out on it and they said, oh, OK, so now we're not going to do it anymore. But Crisis Text Line still is the majority owner of Loris AI data analytics. So there you go for local solutions. Uh, most philanthropic funding, however, comes from ordinary people with extraordinary generosity, not from the millionaires and billionaires who appear in mass media. And to be effective in their giving, these ordinary people need access to communities that they can exchange ideas and sources of innovation. Social networks are beginning to transform the way individual philanthropists collaborate with one another. And I would say that, you know, I feel like that that, again, is just more bs because it isn't actually about individual people it is about major global capital and like the networks of collaborators are going to be like the the blue meridian partners and their catalytic capital and you know among these i did this map back in 2018 but these are the people who are investing in early childhood and it's the duke endowment the packard kaiser Druck and stanley Druckenmiller, who is george soros's hedge fund manager Ed McConnell Clark was sort of the vehicle for that. The Schustermans, JPB Foundation, Hewlett Packard, and the Sandberg Foundation. So it's these major, major foundations that create vast pools of money. Those are the people collaborating. Those are the, the, the people, the, the story that they want to tell about like people in your local giving circle to maybe fund a playground. That's not what's moving the needle. That's not what's remaking the world into the metaverse. It's these collaborators that are doing it. So, and again, this is just from the Global Impact Management Project. 2,000 of the world's largest asset holders, they now have a platform, uh, they have an impact frontier. You've got the Global Impact Investment Network, which is one of the organizations I found very early on who built the game. Um, it was funded by Rockefeller when Judith Rodin, she left Penn and went over to the Rockefeller Foundation and she created the Global Impact Investment Network. And then you've got the, the IFRS. I'm not sure exactly what that is, but I guess it's about oh, the International Sustainability Standards Board. So everything needs a standard, everything needs a data point. Um, these are the collaborators that are happening. It's not, they, they wanna pull you in and act like you just need to know how to be the right kind of philanthropist in your community. Um, you know, go to the United Way webinar or something, but that's just a distraction from from the people who are really moving the system. So again, I mentioned that Laura Aralaga was um, an advisor to on the Robin Hood Foundation, which is Paul Tudor Jones, the guy in pink tight or green tights, sorry, the um, who was working with Drucken Miller and the Harlem Children's Zone. That was the the crucible for a lot of this, you know, starting in the eighties. Uh, he, uh, Stanley Drucken Miller and Jeffrey Canada were at Bowdoin together in Maine, and they used uh, the. Harlem Children's Zone as the wraparound service model. And much of that money came from uh, Tudor, Tudor Capital Investments, which is uh, Paul Tudor Jones, uh, who also made the Robin Hood Foundation. And he has ties, interestingly enough, to Tennessee. So now that I'm revisiting Tennessee in light of Oak Ridge and the Atomic Energy Commission, that feels a bit different. Um, but she was on their board. This is a, a case study. Um, there's all these Stanford Business School case studies. So a case study on this from 20, 2007. Here she is on the Learning Technology Advisory Board. There you've also got David Siegel, who was on her board. Um, so, you know, these are these are these are the power players. These are the people that we need to know. So this is the Palantir. I think we're in the home stretch from the last 10 slides. Um, as the volume of data collected increases, new ways of filtering the information that is gathered will be essential. Palantir, which builds software to glean insights from large sources of data, is at the leading edge of these efforts. Through the company's philanthropy engineering team, it partners with nonprofits on initiative ranging from the allocation of medicines that are about to expire to the coordination of efforts among volunteers in the wake of a natural disaster. Palantir offers its services at no or very low cost, low bono, 
but not all nonprofits have the knowledge or data infrastructure to partner with the company. All right, so that's Palantir. We all know Palantir deep ties to Homeland Security, uh, you know, national security. I, I can't remember if it's the FBI, like policing, immigration. They're the ones who are going to be running the data on these impact deals. So um, this they're is in everything. Uh, <laughs> they're into everything. Jason has been keeping an eye on the Palantir uh, video channel because he's they relocated from the Bay Area to Denver. So and we actually we did a, a, a a site visit to the Palantir headquarters, which is super low key in downtown Denver. And so Jason, since not many people in Denver are talking about it, he's been keeping an eye out. But this is an old uh, video clip uh, from the that pay for success finance deal with uh, Project Welcome Home. So remember, this is all happening. And then, you know, a few years later, Laura and Mark are saying, not in my backyard. I don't want these people. I'm just going to tell you how to do philanthropy, right? Um, we need to keep those people somewhere else. So this this clip speaks to the data collection. This this young woman is from Palantir. And this is from 2016. UCSF in the PFS program is that we help design the randomized control trial study design and we're the program evaluator for the 6.25 your uh, project. Some of the challenges in working with administrative data is that data are often siloed from one another. So healthcare data don't speak to behavioral health data, don't speak to um, data from the jail system, and often those don't speak to housing data. And especially for chronically homeless individuals who are um, interacting with all parts of the a county system, you really need all those data sources to get a complete picture. One of the biggest challenges that we face in trying to better utilize our data is complying not only with all the legal protections that um, must be complied with very thoughtfully in order to utilize that data. And that's been a consistent challenge that we face, that other governments around the country have faced, and we knew we had to figure out a solution for. When Palantir was approached for this project, we knew we had to do it. It was right at the intersection of the types of projects we like to work on. First, there's a clear need for data and better data infrastructure. She talks like Second, Mark Zuckerberg. it's mission-oriented and socially impactful. Third is that it really values outcomes, which is core to Palantir's philosophy. And fourth, it's right in our backyard. Palantir built an integrated data platform that links across key social services databases to provide a holistic view of homeless clients within the county. So now Abode, UCSF, and the county can all log into the system and see not only real time how the program's tracking, but also be able to look at trends and do analyses on how to make social services better in the future. Uh, one of the problems we have is a lot of what we want to do is actually illegal in with regards to <laughs> privacy. And so that's something we're really having to think a lot about. <laughs> It's a pretty, pretty well. It's incredible interesting. Video. The woman in the middle, in the blue, she actually used to work for the ACLU of Northern California. So, uh, like the, yeah. the, they're just—it's sad, you know. Yes. They—they're just making excuses. Incredible. So yeah. So 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 let's see. So she. Okay. Whoops. Sorry. So she moved moved to Denver. This is Alice. Alice's uh, job is the privacy and civil liberties engineering. So I think that that's just useful to know. Like this is how they spin all of this, that they're going to, to engineer your civil liberties and, and to fit with the impact finance space. Um, and the home stretch, the absence of market forces that motivate the private sector to embrace change has also slowed phil philanthropy's adoption of technology. To be clear, the barriers to adoption are not technological. The systems needed to transform philanthropy exist today and tapping into them requires relatively modest financial investment. For philanthropy to embrace technology and the advances it brings, it will take a change in mindset among both philanthropy professionals and individual givers. Okay, which is so ironic that they're saying that there's not a market force to motivate the private sector to, or to, to um, absence of market forces is what's slowing down philanthropy's adoption of technology because it's actually just the opposite. Like the market needs for the philanthropy <laughs> to adopt this technology, but they just need to provide a really good cover story. And that's the, the change in mindset, right? Like we need to change the mindset. And again, just to reiterate, that's what Laura does. She's about, here's her social Silicon Valley social venture fund. We are learning together. Doesn't this look, look like fun? We're just learning how to be good givers. And, you know, and 
here she is. This is her foundation. We're going to empower and educate and equip people to do the right thing. Like we have a whole foundation that doesn't actually give grants. We just teach people how to be good givers. Um, and they're actually even bringing it to the high school classroom, right? <laughs> they're, gonna, they're, they're at all of the levels of bringing people along. And um, this, I think this is the last one. Um, as online platforms democratize, giving and pressure mounts to find new measurable models of change, harnessing technology could dramatically increase our ability to develop scalable solutions to some of the world's biggest problems. All the technology tools we need are in our hands right now. What are we waiting for? And then this is the last image. <laughs> yeah, I, so got, I got to bring this one up about. big. <laughs> I, I, I got to make this one so big so everybody sad. can see it. I mean, essentially, like, so this is this is the biodiversity tracking, right? I didn't realize that there are these biodiversity offsets in addition to carbon offsets. And so this is like what a connected jungle looks like. You've got acoustic monitoring. You've got a visual and thermal imaging on the trees. You've got heart rate monitors on the animals. You've got drones. You've got animal tracking, like with GPS. You've got like Wi-Fi on the beehives and weather monitoring stations. And this is all <laughs> part of the EU's biodiversity strategy. I mean, it's 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 insanity. And I mean, in some ways, you know, if you guys haven't had a chance to listen to the conversation that Leo and I had on the, that 50 degree, 53 degree podcast about the interspecies currency, like this is it. Like the giraffes are earning their keep by wearing the GPS. So eventually maybe, and they're paying for their drone surveillance by wearing the tracking technology. Like that's exactly what's happening. And, you know, I can't tell you how many people who are so invested in sustainability that, that, they don't know this. Like they don't, they've not looked at it. Like I can't believe anyone who had actually cares about animals or cares about the environment would look at that and go, oh yeah, that seems logical. It's not logical except for in the nature of like capital flows and digital empire. Like that's the only way it's logical. And so, you know, I guess just to sort of close out and I don't know if anybody has any, any questions, um, but you know, this 2015 article or the, the 2015 paper about disruptive technology and philanthropy by Laura Ayalaga and its connection to like the heart, right? And that and our values and how we give and making our giving visible. Um, it's all about being able to dissect the story and find the true storyline. Again, I'm not saying maybe I only have the only storyline, but to consider alternate potentials in the storyline and to question and to critically think about what's being said, what's being left out and to have the ethical conversations because I feel like, honestly, like I do wanna live in a world that we have values. I don't want them coded in cyber physical systems and I want them to be human. And I know like, honestly, being human is going to mean messing up sometimes for sure. But we, we need, to, the only way to have values is to live them, but we, we shouldn't be living them through tokens. So, um, and we shouldn't be living them for BlackRock and we shouldn't li be living them for smart impact bonds and people shouldn't be commodities and animals shouldn't be commodities. This, this data empire is, is bad news and we have to figure out the right way to talk about it. Oh, now the sun has moved again. So I guess. Uh -huh. <laughs> <laughs> see see if we had enough data we could have planned for that we would have been able to know i know well you know what this is human though this is our imperfections of production quality so um yeah so i anyway, just thought i'd bring that um, image up a little bit bigger just so people could get you know a nice view because this this image yeah, really this is, does it says it all <laughs> it says it, it all does. and it, I mean, you know or, or replace the giraffe with the home okay. with, with your child or a homeless person uh yeah you know. mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Awesome. So, I don't know, Jason, I know this was a bit of a slog, but I mean, did you feel like, was it helpful? Not at all. I, I have no clue what you're talking about. <laughs> you better say the right thing. I mean, I guess we're just documenting it. Part of it is just documenting this stuff, you know? So people can't say, well, how do, how did this happen? Well, I don't know. They were talking about it like five years ago, but yeah, well, the people will catch up. And I, and I keep saying this, but like, it, it's kind of abstract for most people, unless you're actually working in this space at, with a nonprofit or you're working in social impact. It's it's totally foreign to people. You're, you're talking about something that's not a part of people's day to, daily lives yet. And so as they as it becomes more and more uh, integrated into their lives, and they'll, they start to see 
what this thing actually is, I think they'll come back. <laughs> you got to go. I'm sorry, it's dinner. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, it's, we did. I think yeah. we did. We're we're at like. Uh, I think we've done almost five hours. So that's pretty. That was a pretty good run. <laughs> I know. I'm always long form. What can I say? Do oh, people stay so with us? I can't see any. Hold on. I got some spam. BS oh. type user from this channel report. Boom. Okay, let me get rid of this clown. Sorry, I try to keep up with it. That's okay. We got some spammer, spammer. Hide user. Get out of here. We don't want you. Okay, sorry. Uh, <laughs> yeah, I think we covered a lot. And hopefully, you know, I would love to hear, we, we would love to hear your feedback, from, uh, you know, uh, about what you guys think about this stuff. And start to share this stuff, you know, like that's the thing that's, it's, you know, we need more people talking about this so it's 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 if it's just like a few people it doesn't it also doesn't help for it to sink in with people you know uh but but it's like and you know, i have people... to say i mean that's right. part of the whole like the the discourse board i mean i was hoping that we could get to a point that people could see how this is presenting in their community and then talk about case studies and share it out. Because I, you know, I, I think in some ways, for whatever reason, I can be a polarizing figure in this, or people are like, oh, I don't wanna listen to her because I don't like her, or I don't, whatever. So that's fine. I don't need for people to like me. I'm not here for like the popularity club, but I need that this is too important to like suppress it simply because currently we're the face of it. Like there's a small group of us who are talking about it. and. If for some reason you just have a personality issue with me, you've decided you're not going to deal with it because that actually is not cool and it's not going to help anybody. Um, so I'd really like for more people to take th this on and incorporate. I mean, I've given a people a huge head start in terms of how the structure works and then incorporate their knowing into it. I've even offered, you know, from my blog, if people would like to write something from their perspective about how it impacts you in, because it's everything, right? It's, it's elder care, it's the forests, it's, you know, I need people, but I need people to actually like buck up a bit and like get confident, like have some confidence in yourself that your voice matters. Like you don't have to be, write a research paper. You don't have, doesn't have to be like, just do it like because you uh, you grow in the doing of it, I think is what I'm I'm hoping for. That's what I'm hoping for in this is group is that we can get to that space. Yeah, we'll see. And and again, like if, if you want to if you do, if you are ch check out our our forum and uh, under the about under categories about there's a, a forum guidelines and rules and you can read through kind of the thought process. And if it sounds like something you'd like to participate in and that you're down with, like, you know, doing you know working within the the parameters that we're we're trying to lay out we would love to have you because we want to we need we want more people uh to to be sharing in this in this research so um, but also don't be offended if <laughs> if it's not a good fit <laughs> <laughs> again that, that's why i made it public because everybody can you know access this and and utilize the things that are being posted um even if they're not contributing um yeah. So I think we did great. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, and then again, okay. Allison's right. blog. All right. Well, yep. uh, we All did right. a good run. Thank you guys. Dinner. Thanks you guys for joining us and good night.